This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international programme of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and today I'm joined by Lee Hutchison. How are you, Lee? Yeah, it's a pleasure to... Whenever we seem to do these, they always seem to be landmark days. I think the last time we did one of these was the day Lower Decks premiered and today we're chatting uh, on Star Trek Day. So uh, obviously I've dated your podcast a little bit, but we seem to, to pick our moments. You have, and I'd forgotten that's when we were recording last time round. I mean, this also will give an insight for the listeners into the chaotic recording schedule of Primitive Culture, especially since lockdown, because uh, that episode, I haven't even begun to edit yet. I have no idea when that one will be going out, probably uh, a while after this. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is uh, Star Trek Day today, the 8th of September 2020, so 54 years, uh, and it's a, a big day. There's a load of stuff going on on the official Star Trek website, um, some panels that are taking place, kind of another one of these sort of virtual conventions, I guess, uh, that they're running over there. Um, so yeah, an exciting day, an appropriate day to be podcasting. Yeah, it's, it's definitely good to, good to chat about Star Trek. Now this uh, topic, we're basically continuing, Lee, with this series that Tony and I started uh, about a month or so ago, looking at the episode names in Star Trek. Um, and I feel I should kind of apologise to the listeners who've been waiting for their latest episode of Primitive Culture, because I have been a bit held up, partly... Uh, I was trying to find a time for me and Tony to sit down and record this one. And then in the end, um, he said to me, he's basically just a bit Star trek out. He's just finished his book all about Star Trek. And he, he, he basically said, look, can you give me a break for a while? <laughs> I can't, I can't bear to talk about any more Star Trek right now, even on Star Trek day. Hence, I, uh, dropped you a line, Lee, and said, would you mind subbing for him and, and stepping in and, and taking us through, um, basically the kind of early period of Deep Space Nine and the kind of tail end of next gen is what we're going to be covering this time round. Yeah, I really, I've, I think I messaged you when you started this kind of little, uh, like kind of project. I think he's kind of joked on the podcast, like, I don't know if anyone will be interested in this, but I mean, I'm obviously a primitive culture fan, but I always enjoy things like this where it goes into the possibly the nerdiest kind of detail about Star Trek, <laughs> but given it sort of that cultural twist as well, because there's yeah. certainly many interesting kind of titles thrown in amongst some less kind of creative ones so yeah it, it seemed like the perfect kind of jam for me for me in lockdown when i been when went on these long walks listening to two hours of star trek fans just chatting about episode titles like there's definitely an audience for that and i i'm proud to be that audience <laughs> Well, that's good that we've, we've found at least one person who, who is interested in this. I've quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoy doing them partly because they don't involve all that much research and we can, you know, Google stuff as we go along as needed. Also, uh, we've had some great feedback on the Babel conference for some of the previous episodes. I'd really recommend listeners to go and check those out because, uh, some of our listeners are much better read clearly than I am, uh, picking up, uh, either things that, that we just missed altogether or possibly slightly different resonances to some things that we picked up before. Um, so some of these titles, you know, actually tracing back exactly where does that phrase or that idea kind of come from? Uh, sometimes these are quite tricky problems, uh, to solve basically, but I'm, I, I'm glad you found it interesting anyway. I, sometimes I feel it's, it reminds me a little bit. Um, when I was at school, we had a maths teacher who was quite strict. And if anyone messed about in his class, he would set, uh, he would set an essay basically as punishment instead of setting lines. Um, and the essay would be, 
on he, he would come up with a subject that was like the most uh boring subjects he could think of basically to force you to write about something utterly tedious and one of them that i remember was to write about the inside of a ping pong ball and you know you had to write a thousand words on the inside of a ping pong ball that was the challenge um so I don't know, sometimes i sort of wonder is you know like you said this level of nerdy detail uh this is really tracing the inside of the ping pong ball in some ways on the other hand i do think that these questions about titles are both interesting and to some degree important. I mean, we've seen with Lower Decks, uh, the shift back to putting the titles up on the screen. Um, and I don't know about you, I feel like it's partly there's the whole nostalgia. It's the fact it's in the next gen font and everything. It feels quite nostalgic, and, you know, as the show does generally. But actually, there is something quite nice about, um, seeing even these slightly weird titles like Moist Vessel uh, was the most recent one we had, I think. Uh, you know, s- seeing that up there in the kind of old style and and getting the episode name right at the start of the story rather than having to go and, you know, look it up and work out what that one was called. Yeah, I've found that that's been my... Like, I know people have their issues with some of the, the more recent kind of Star Treks in terms of maybe the character arcs or things like that. But for me, it's been like... I, I love seeing those episode titles because I, I can immediately go, I like that episode. Or I have an opinion on that episode. Whereas I struggle with sometimes with that with Star Trek Picard or something where like, I'm like, you know, that episode where such and such happens as opposed to being able to mm. tell you the title outright. If, that, I've always found that just slightly frustrating. And I always think, well, at least if you don't want to put titles on the screen, you know, when, you know, the content's on, why not just put it when you have that writer director part in the, the credits? You know, that way I would remember, you know, your remembrance from your, um, you know, you know, music to make the sanest man go mad or something like that. At least that way it'll be stuck in my head and I feel like I can chat about Star Trek a little bit more. I'm handicapped. They've got that obvious space to do it. You're right. To do it. Um, I mean, they, Doctor Who, they do that, don't they? They always put the episode title written by, directed by, you, you know, that's kind of part, that's at the end of the credits. So the rest of the credits is the same every week. Uh, but that goes in the sort of title, not quite a title card. It's like a, the final sort of card of the credits in a sense. And, um, you, you know, you're right. Star Trek already does that with Discovery and Picard because they have, they, they, uh, highlight the writer. And the director, I think, in that way, which they never did before. You know, it used to be something that would come up on the screen probably after all the guest stars and the producers and all that stuff at the bottom while you're distracted by the actual action uh, taking place. But you're right. They do now um, give that kind of little moment to to mark those things and yet not mark the title, weirdly. Yeah, it's just a frustrating one. It just feels like it could be the, the easiest fix in the world. And I, I just... I, I know that the, it says a lot about Star Trek fans that there was that genuine excitement when it came to Lower Decks of like, the titles are back, you know, I, I would love, to, I think, that, <laughs> I think you know, if people want to go back and like edit up sort of the previous Disco Picard episodes, it'd be the easiest thing in the, in the world to do and this fan would appreciate it. Well, and these titles, they are important. I wanted to, um, just before we get into uh, kind of DS9 and, and Next Gen. Um, in the last episode, Tony and I were talking a little bit about uh, Nicholas Meyer's book, A View from the Bridge, and uh, he discusses uh, both the Star Trek films that he directed, um, the kind of battles that took place over the titles, because obviously... Um, the Undiscovered Country ended up being called The Undiscovered Country, but initially that was the name of the script that he wrote and filmed uh, for Star Trek II uh, before it became first The Vengeance of Khan and then The Wrath of Khan. And there's quite a kind of funny story uh, in his book where, you, you know, this being his, 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 you know, kind of big break for him in a sense, this his first Star Trek project. And he's kind of right in the middle of shooting the film when he gets uh, a call from his assistant basically saying that the studio have changed the name. They're not calling it The Undiscovered Country anymore, which he always thought was his great Shakespearean title. Um, they're going to call it The Vengeance of Khan. Um, and so he decides to call up uh, an executive, a Paramount executive in New York, and kind of try and have a little argument with him about it. But it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and it, he sort of says, you know, I gather you're changing the name of my movie. And he's like, yeah, that's right. And he says, have you seen the movie? And the guy says, no, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, and he says, have you read the script? He says, no, I haven't read the script. Um, and he basically says, you know, don't you think it might have been polite to talk to me about it before you decide to change the name of the film. And the guy just says, um, he's, he's got this great line. He says, they followed what I took to be a puzzled pause three time zones away. And then Mr. Meyer, I'm only trying to do what's best for the movie. Um, so in the end, he backed down and he kind of went with it and they changed it to the vengeance of Khan. And then they ended up changing it obviously to the wrath of Khan because of that whole Star Wars 
business going on with the uh, Revenge of the Jedi and so on. Um, but it's quite interesting when it comes to Undiscovered Country. Obviously, this is many years later. Maya has, you know, Star Trek success under his belt. He's back for this kind of one last film. And they sort of try to pull the same trick again. He's, he thinks he's finally got his dream title, The Undiscovered Country. Uh, you know, he sort of had a second chance with it. And then yet again, um, he finds out that the the studio are unhappy about it basically um so i thought i might just read this little extract because it's i think it's quite illustrative in some ways um, are you trying to say you couldn't get your friend of the show nicholas meyer to come on to the podcast and, and, <laughs> and, got and into, yeah. do as a little audio book and stuff like that I, like I, I, did you really have such a bad time with him <laughs> I didn't even think of that. It's an excellent idea. Funnily enough, um, I don't know if you listened or read, you, you know, his, cause you and I both interviewed Maya recently, um, about his Sherlock Holmes novel. And in the audio book of that, cause I listened to it on Audible, he do, he records the footnotes basically. So they've got a narrator, you know, they've got an actor reading the, the story, but because he has these footnotes, which are sort of in the voice of Nicholas Meyer, the author kind of saying, and this is where I found this document and this is where I had to stop my research into Sherlock Holmes to go and, uh, work on star trek discovery or whatever they actually had he he recorded them himself which is kind of a strange postmodern uh little twist there yeah maybe i didn't cross my mind i should have thought of that sorry lee but i'll you'll just have to make do with me instead um so this is what he says is during the post-production period i was informed by art cohen and barry london heads of pr and marketing that they would like to meet regarding the title of the movie it was deja vu all over again. After we'd sat down and sipped our coffees, they told me they felt that the undiscovered country as a title was soft. But I was in a different position now than I'd been in 10 years earlier, when no one except my assistant, Jana Wong, had even troubled to inform me that my title was being discarded. Listen, I responded, you've exhausted all the superlatives. We've had the final, the last, the ultimate. No one is paying any attention. Put aside for the moment the fact that no one cares what the subtitle of a Star Trek movie is, you might do well to throw people a curveball this time. Something oblique like, well, the undiscovered country. I put up my hands before they could respond and went on amicably. However, let me make this easy for you. If anyone comes up with a better title, I will be happy to relinquish mine. And then he goes on and says, in the good old days of real studios, before they became subsidiaries of conglomerates and bean counters, titles were often decided via a contest. The secretary who named the movie got a bonus. Nowadays, the matter is turned over to a computer, which will take a word and do mechanical riffs on it. Take, for example, the word escape. The computer will spew forth escape to the future, escape from tomorrow, escape to yesterday, big escape, great escape, etc. Or try the word bridge and you'll get bridge to the future, bridge across tomorrow, bridge from the past, and so forth, before proceeding to the next word. Love, hate, death, balloons... When we reconvened, I found myself in a huge room populated by over 30 men and women whose job it was to help sell Star Trek VI. Reams of computer printouts confronted me. I picked up the first title, I forget what it was, read it slowly, and then asked what the assembly thought of it. No one seemed very taken, so I went with deliberation onto the second name, Bridge to Tomorrow. Any takers? I inquired. Silence. As I prepared to go on to bridge number three of what looked to be 10,000 possibilities, Barry London interrupted. You win, he smiled. And so did I. So that's how Nicholas Meyer managed to to keep his his uh, preferred title for that film was basically by wearing them down, by forcing them to go through so many potential alternatives that they lost the will to live, basically. I think we'll discover, obviously, I'm sure you'll be, be doing the movies at some point that, you know, how they use the undiscovered country in relation to, to the film uh, in terms of, oh, like, to the future, clearly has no relation to what undiscovered country means in sort of the, the Shakespeare, um, I can't remember which one it comes from, uh, the meaning Habits, that Shakespeare yeah. uh, had for it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite amusing how he was stuck to this title, but the reality was it wasn't so kind of tied into to what Shakespeare kind of saw of it. Yeah, it's an interesting one that and they do kind of tap into that in the film itself because obviously you have that awkward moment where um Kirk looks kind of shocked. Uh I can't remember is it I think it's Chang who uses the phrase in this unless it's Gorkon, but is it Gorkon who yeah. says it? Yeah, he proposed called, a toast and then, and then he to says the undiscovered the country. It's the undiscovered country and then he says the future or one of them says the future. But there's this sort of moment of like are you proposing a toast to what? <laughs> you know, to death. Uh, and it seems like this kind of grim. It's, it's, it's interesting because it is almost a moment of mistranslation. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're not going into the kind of mechanics of the universal translator in that moment, but this is a kind of diplomatic function in a sense. They are, uh, having to communicate across a language barrier. And I suppose if you want to take it all really, uh, literally and, and seriously and so on, if the Klingons read Shakespeare in Klingon, 
then Shakespeare has been translated. I mean, Shakespeare has been translated into Klingon. You can go and buy the Klingon Hamlet and uh, read whatever the Klingon expression for the undiscovered country is. But presumably, it is possible in a situation like that, that something gets translated into another language and it changes the meaning uh, to a certain extent. I remember seeing a talk by a translator uh, oh no, it was, it was a talk, it was a talk about translations. There, there was a translator speaking, there was a writer speaking. Um, and there was a particular story that this novelist told of having written a book, um, about an arms dealer, um, who ended up in his book, uh, through a kind of poetic justice. He was a nasty guy and he ended up losing an arm. Um, and the, and then he said he was, he was touring this book abroad and there was some kind of, uh, someone came up to him and said, you know, oh, I really liked your book, but I thought, um, I was a bit shocked when the guy had his penis chopped off. And the guy was like, what? What do you, what do you mean he had his penis chopped off? I didn't write that. And he said, oh, well, that's what it, that's what it says in my copy of the book. And he showed him whatever language it was. And it turns out that the translation, um, for, uh, arms, the, 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 the phrase, the relationship between the phrase arms dealer and someone's arm, which works in English, didn't work, uh, in whatever language it was. And the closest the translator would c- come up with was a word that meant both penis and weapon. Uh, and so he'd said this was a weapons trader and therefore he lost his weapon, essentially. <laughs> and so he trans, you know, in trying to find a way of making essentially this joke work in a different language, he completely changed the meaning of what had actually happened. Um, so who knows if that, if a, kind of mistranslation on that level is possible, then it's, it seems pretty minor for the Klingons to uh, bring in this slightly threatening ambiguity around whether the undiscovered country is the future or death. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they double down on it towards the end where it's like, um, you know, to the undiscovered country, you know, the future and stuff like that, they really do do go for their sort of new translation. Well, I mean, we're not even really approaching the different languages uh, that Star Trek is translated into the different titles. I mean, I know Star Trek is massive in Germany, for example. Presumably, all of these episodes have German titles, which may carry totally different uh, resonances uh, to the English ones. I mean, there's a whole other, you know, who knows how many podcasts we could be uh, going in if we had all the translators in to, to look at these. But for now, we're just going to focus on the original English titles. Um and let's start basically with uh, the last episode we took us up right up to the sort of cusp of Deep Space Nine. So we'll start today with the DS9 pilot Emissary. Now, interestingly, a different episode from The Emissary, which was a next gen episode, but people often get those two confused, I think. Yeah, that's what kind of I immediately think of. I think this one isn't sort I think there's maybe a, I wish I had it to, to hand, but there's also a couple episodes kind of like this where, you know, you have first contact, the TV show, first contact, the, the movie. You have this one where it's like, okay, usually you probably wouldn't have it. I couldn't imagine sort of, we have like a future one come out called The Storyteller. I couldn't kind of imagine them sort of doing two, The Storyteller and A Storyteller but when it comes to the kind of pilot, I think they get sort of a, a bit of a free pass to sort of just drop the, the, and sort of, you know, kind of just strip it down to, to emissary. It's, I immediately sort of think of these two episodes as a, a sort of little pairing just based on the title alone. It's also one of those episodes, which I think you get sometimes in that kind of Michael Piller era where there's just the ghost of a pun there. I mean, obviously it's about the emissary. Cisco is the emissary. That's his role. That's going to be very important in DS9 as we go on. There's also a slight sense this episode is an emissary for the series insofar as it's a pilot. Do you know what I mean? There's a kind of, it's kind of appropriate to call the pilot episode or something emissary because it is something you're sending forth. Uh, you know, it's your kind of ambassador. It's your kind of first, uh, meeting point almost for this new project, for this new experience. Um, you, you know, so just as, as Cisco is the emissary from the prophets to the people of Bajor, uh, emissary is the emissary for Deep Space Nine. And, you know, like any good pilot, it does really lay out very strongly uh, what this series is, how it's different specifically from Next Gen. Uh, you know, it kind of, it provides an excellent introduction in that sense. Um, and I don't know, it does just cross my mind. Is there a kind of, was that somewhere at the back of someone's mind when they decided what to call this? Because they could have called it all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be. Uh, I mean, if you think about it in a sense, calling it emissary frames the whole story very much within the Bajoran religious context rather than the geopolitical context, uh, even the kind of 
linear time context and all that sort of thing, uh, the wormhole. Do you know what I mean? There are lots of other ways that they could have decided to sort of frame this story and focusing it in not just on the car- the captain himself, but also on the captain in this role that certainly in this episode and for the early seasons of DS9 is not one that he's particularly comfortable with does sort of seem to be saying something it's kind of a statement of intent to some extent i think you're spot on with the statement of intent i mean it's one of those ones to think of that a lot of people have spoken about that obviously this era we're living in with multiple star trek shows that it reminds them of the peak star trek in kind of the 90s with multiple tv shows and, and movies on the go i mean this is obviously the first star trek series of the the kind of 90s you know deep uh, next generation was 87 sort of an origin of the time this is something where it's star trek's kind of going out there into the the 90s with the sort of this show something a bit sort of darker a little bit kind of you know more serialized you you have a you know the first kind of black captain you have a, a lot of kind of firsts for the the franchise kind of going on here something very different and something very much of the the kind of 90s whereas you know very much the start of obviously something like star trek the next generation was very much of the 80s in terms of its kind of philosophy and sort of ambitions this feels like a very 90s and in a positive way sort of tv show and and that star trek going out into that world that you know it's serialized and that's something that will become a bit more prevalent towards the end of the, the nineties with, you know, a lot of the HBO shows with things like the Sopranos, for example. So, you know, it's, it's Star Trek's kind of emissary into, into the nineties television in a, a very different way, I think. Mm, absolutely. That's an interesting point. And the kind of serialization, you know, running alongside, I guess, something like the X-Files or Babylon 5, you know, these other shows that kind of did serialization in, you know, quite groundbreaking ways for the time. So, you know, who knows, maybe Emissary is not just an Emissary for Star Trek, but for kind of TV generally. This is, you know, <laughs> Star Trek sticking its neck out. Um, next up, we have Past Prologue, uh, which is a kind of... Um, a slight adjustment of a Shakespearean quotation, what's past is prologue. Uh, the idea that, you know, whatever happened before is a prologue to what's happening now, uh, taken from The Tempest. I once uh, read a script for a short film which had a terribly contorted joke uh, that was trying to work around this this line, which was someone um, trying to persuade someone to ignore their past. And the line was, what's past is prologue, and everyone skips that chapter anyway, or <laughs> something along those lines, which doesn't even quite make sense. But I kind of, you get the gist of it, basically, uh, was, was trying to say, forget about the past. I mean, I think really with Deep Space Nine, the past is absolutely critical and, and, you know, remembering the past is, is key. And in fact, again, you could, you could say past the idea of what's past is prologue is so central to Deep Space Nine more generally. If you think about the occupation, if you think about the kind of past of the various characters, um, particularly, you know, in this situation, Kira, and we later find out more about Odo's past as well. Um, it's quite a key sort of idea, I think, really for the way that this show is going to do that kind of storytelling. And again, slightly in contrast to Next Gen. It's also, of course, an episode title that, you know, we had Emissary, which had kind of turned up in Next Gen as the Emissary. Past Prologue turns up in Discovery as what's past is Prologue, which is the actual quotation. So again, the, the, you know, two for two DS9 with titles that are kind of going to, tran- you know, cross over to other um, Star Trek series, weirdly, and almost, almost identical reuses. Yeah, and it's interesting as well when you think of kind of where Deep Space Nine sort of is at the time, and we obviously have the return of the Duras sisters for the first time since we we saw them with the the kind of Klingon Civil War and um, sort of the the quotation what uh, what is past as prologue is sort of engraved on the National Archives building in Washington D.C. and um, is commonly used by the military um, when discussing the similarities between war throughout history. When you sort of think of the the Bajorans, they've just come fresh off a a war um, kind of period of time sort of with the Cardassians and obviously we have something like this kind of with you know the first appearance of these kind of um, renegades after their antics within a, a kind of war and sort of the conflict of how everything's kind of fallen out you have someone like Garrick making his first appearance how does he kind of fit in with everything it's, it's all really quite quite interesting sort of thinking about the the state of play with you know a lot of these characters after sort of taking parts in wars. That is very interesting, uh, especially thinking about kind of history 
uh, you know, world history and, and kind of war and conflict and, and these sorts of things, because obviously DS9 as a series will go on. I mean, we talked about Emissary kind of laying the groundwork for this, you know, seven season arc of, of Cisco as a religious icon up to the point where he actually, you know, is kind of a God living in the heavens, essentially by the end of the series. Um, DS9, of course, also has this view of history, which seems to be very cyclical. You know, things seem to sort of come around. They, they kind of come back, uh, if in a slightly different form. So we've had the, uh, Cardassian occupation of Beja, or then we have the, uh, Dominion occupation of the station. Then we have, you know, by the end of the series, Cardassia, uh, you know, sort of devastated by the Dominion and this kind of sense of, um, not exactly poetic justice, but kind of things, things coming around and, you know, Kira helping to train the Cardassian resistance and this, this sense of that line, uh, where Damar says, what sort of people would, would do this kind of thing when his family is killed? And she says, yeah, what sort of people, Damar? You, you know, this kind of sense that the same patterns, the same kind of, uh, traumas are repeated over and over again somehow throughout history. Yeah, we sort of obviously see that now with sort of kind of gets retroactively added in. We have this Klingon war as well that we see with Discovery. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see something else like that happen in a, you know, you'll be able to debate that in the future episodes of The Way of the Warrior, for mm-hmm. example. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of, you know, history does repeat itself for, for better or worse in Star Trek, whether that's the writing could maybe be a bit better, some new ideas, or whether that is just history uh, repeating itself, which passes prologue. And I think based on what we see in a lot of society just now, that, that does seem kind of accurate. Now, the next episode, I should say other people might have a different order for these, because I think some of these were shot and broadcast in slightly uh, different orders. But the next one on my list anyway is A Man Alone. Um Sadly, as far as I know, there's no episode of Lower Decks forthcoming called Men Alone or <laughs> A Woman Alone or whatever. But who knows, you know, if uh, if they can extend this kind of pattern of, of DS9 uh, tying into the other series. But I quite like this title. I think it's got a great kind of noir feel to it. Uh, you know, Odo is this kind of, uh, as the sort of slightly noirish detective, it really fits that. It also... Um, I discovered is the title of a Western, which is interesting, a 1955 Western, um, which I think is also kind of significant. So obviously, Star Trek has always been this sort of wagon train concept. Uh, but I think DS9 in some ways lent into that more, certainly more than next gen, and in some ways, maybe even more than the original series, in that you do have this setup of basically a floating town in space in the wild west effectively with all these strange characters coming into town and odo is the sheriff basically i mean they call him the constable but they they could easily have called him sheriff instead of that and you know as much as he's this kind of there's this sort of gumshoe you know dixon hill type hardball detective thing going on with odo there's also very much i think that idea of you, you know the the one guy who has to bring law and order to this kind of unruly environment I'd actually go one further. I think there's something that we'll, we see kind of, I think it's obviously got almost potentially a dual meaning. When you think of Wild West, you know, it's synonymous with Star Trek, mm-hmm. that wagon train to the stars. But we also think of what we'll see perhaps later in, in Star Trek, uh, Deep Space Nine, and that is kind of the lounge singers of Las Vegas. And A Man Alone is a song by Frank Sinatra. And if you let me, I'll, I'll quickly go through some of the, the lyrics here. And if, you know, are you going to sing it for me, Lee? Uh, unfortunately not. I'm, well, you can get um, <laughs> Nicholas Meyer. I can get Frank Sinatra back from the grave or, or Bobby Darren to, to do a cover. But, you know, when I sort of... Or even James it, Darren. Yeah. When I looked over the, the lyrics, I was like, man, that this sounds a lot like Odo. I mean, it, in me, you see a man alone, held by habit of being on his own, a man who listens to the trembling of the trees with sentimental ease. Um, if you see me, a man alone, behind the wall, he's learned to call his home, a man who still goes walking in the rain, expecting love again a man not lonely except when the dark comes a man learning to live with memories of midnight that falls apart dawn if in me you see a man alone drinking up sat sundays and spending time alone a man who knows love is seldom what it seems only others only others people's dreams a man learning to live with memories at midnight then fall apart at dawn if you see me a man alone drinking up sundays and spending them alone a man alone who whose love is seldom what it seems just other people's dreams i mean yes there's there's certain things we might see a bit mm. more of odo in, in the future but you know i i think there's a lot to be taken from that where you can think oh, 
I can see an, an Odo, Odo in this, this, this kind of some of the lyrics in terms of, you know, especially when you think about his habits, you know, he's, uh, you know, a refugee essentially that's called this monstrosity of a Cardassian station, you know, his, his home. And he's, he's, we'll see more of that in the future, what he did during the occupation. And he's had to, to learn to, to live with some of those kind of memories and some of those guilty deeds. And, you know, while they may be a bit repressed just now, we will see them kind of come forward in the, the future. And interesting, I suppose, in a way that the episode calls him a man. It doesn't emphasize his alienness. I mean, Odo is probably the most alien entity that we've seen at the heart of a Star Trek series up to this point. Uh, you, you know, in the regular cast, he's not a solid humanoid, uh, person at some kind of fundamental level, even though that's how he presents to us most of the time. But calling him a man, sort of makes it seem like he is. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of saying this, this is a man. This is a, okay, not literally a human, but essentially a human. Um, as much as all these people are distrustful of him and maybe see him not as a man, see him more as a monster. Yeah, I, I think so too. And uh, yeah, it's, it, I think this is a, a fantastic episode for introducing Odo. And I just think there's, there's, is whether it got inspired by the, the Western film or the Frank Sinatra, I think both, mm. you, you wouldn't be surprised with the kind of the writers involved in Star Trek and, and kind of what they've drawn from, whether that both could have been, been used as sort of a dual meaning. Now, next up on my list anyway, we have Babel. Not a reference, of course, to the Babel Conference, but a reference to the Tower of Babel, uh, the story from the Bible, which explains why people around the world speak different languages and this sense of... Uh, people being unable to communicate and their, their languages not being um, sort of mutually intelligible, I suppose. Um, it's a funny episode. I feel like it gets a little bit of hatred, this episode. I actually find it quite effective in some ways, especially the stuff between Cisco and Jake. I think there's something quite um, genuinely quite scary about this complete breakdown of communication uh, and the kind of horror of it and the danger of it somehow. Um but it's a, it's, it's an odd, it's an odd one. It's an odd DS9 episode. I mean, compared to the previous three, I think it's, it's the one that feels like a kind of next gen holdover. But, um, interesting that it, uh, again, leans here on religious, uh, context, sort of religious allegory in a sense. Um, you, you know, having had Emissary kind of making a big thing of, you know, DS9 being the show that where Star Trek does religion sort of in a big way for the first time. Here we have an episode title that is kind of making a religious allusion um, in a way that is, you know, not unheard of for Star Trek, but certainly not particularly common at this stage. No, and, and also, obviously, you know, the, the very literal meaning of, of Babel as well, you know, being able to speak in different kind of languages and, and tongues. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you see some of that, you know kind of carried out over sort of the, the first few episodes, of, you know, and certainly beyond of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where sort of these characters often communicate in from their different kind of languages, you know, not settled with each other. There's the idea sort of that they're not often talking in kind of sync with each other. You get the odd kind of disagreement perhaps in, in next generation, but they were all very much kind of speaking the kind of the same language as it were in terms of their approach. Whereas Deep Space Nine, there is that sort of inherent conflict between sort of the Bajorans, the Federation, the, you know, the, the merchants on the kind of promenade and so on. So, you know, sometimes even when they're speaking in kind of their, shared English tongue, uh, they're not necessarily always kind of communicating with, with each other. Well, and in Star Trek, I mean, strictly speaking, in Star Trek, people speak Federation Standard, not English, don't they? And I've never quite been clear, is Federation Standard just English and they adopted it in the same way as, you, you know, it might be adopted around the world? Or are we essentially watching all of Star Trek in translation and they're speaking something else? I mean, in the, uh, I know I've mentioned these many times in this podcast, but Ian Banks's, uh, culture novels, they speak a language called Moraine. Uh, and obviously the novels are written in English, but it's understood that all the characters are I mean, your attention is drawn to the fact periodically that the characters are speaking a language which is not the language that you're reading the book in. Um, so I guess there's another... I think start, the whole thing about the universal translator and how Star Trek has worked with translation obviously is not particularly consistent. Sometimes we sort of see it working, uh, particularly like in Discovery, we've seen a little bit more of that. Um, in some of the Kelvin movies, I think we've seen... Uh, sort of glimpses of, of kind of simultaneous translation of the idea of translation going on. In the Undiscovered Country, of course, we have the, you know, don't wait for the translation 
moment. We have this idea that uh, something is being translated. Mostly in Star Trek, it just feels essentially like magic, like uh, somehow everyone is able to speak the same language. Uh, a bit like, you know, again, talking of Doctor Who, uh, in Doctor Who, there's some magic. The TARDIS just like makes everyone mutually intelligible somehow, uh, you know, in this rather kind of biblical uh, way, almost this kind of magical uh, way that everyone can understand each other. But we sort of just have to accept it in Star Trek for the sake of... Um, it's one of those things that we have to not really look too deeply into uh, because ultimately it's not 100% clear if it's going to add up or make sense. But it's it's kind of just a, a narrative um, convenience in a way. Yeah, we 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 all, we all I think it's as you say it's it's for the easiest that we just accept that oh there's just this magical device in their ear. <laughs> um or in the communicator or wherever it is that it's or or in how she's you know uh kind of tricordery like thing or whatever. Um next up we have a next gen episode because of course next gen is still running concurrently with DS9 at this point and we've got the episode ship in a bottle. Um I picked this uh when I was on Trek ranks recently as one of my top WTF uh, moments in Star Trek because I think it's the first episode where that I remember having my mind completely blown as someone who had just just discovered Next Gen basically and it was must have been around this whatever this was sort of sixth season uh, time that it was airing and the reveal that you get in that episode that uh, they're actually they've been inside the holodeck for like you know the last. 30 minutes or something when they think they're walking around on the ship just absolutely blew my mind at the time. Um, obviously, it, you know, it's kind of a, it's appropriate to the episode insofar as there's this idea that the holographic recreation of the enterprise is essentially a ship in a bottle, the bottle being the hollow deck. Um, ships in bottles, you know, there is a ship in a bottle in an episode of Voyager, uh, the one where Joe Carey dies. Um, towards the end, we discover he's been making a Voyager in a bottle. Now, I don't know if, there was a ship in a bottle in Elementary, My Dear Data, which obviously this is kind of a sequel to, but there was that model ship in that episode that Geordie was preparing for um, whoever the captain was that, that was coming to visit, who I think we never got to see. And there is uh, a next-gen scene where O'Brien and Picard have a little chat about ships in bottles, isn't there? So it, it's something that has kind of cropped up in Star Trek over the years, I suppose, this idea which I guess is, you know, a way of sort of tying the nautical naval world of Star Trek into the kind of real world Earth uh, nauticalia in a sense. Um, you, you know, this kind of, there's something quite seductive about the idea of a ship in a bottle and the mystery of how it got in there and how, do, you know, how, how do you do that? How do you construct the thing or, or put the masts up or whatever it is uh, once you've got it through that hole? Um and obviously, in some ways, putting a starship in there is both ridiculous and meaningless, but also it's quite a powerful image. And we, and we see it in like fan art and so on, you know, the various starships in bottles and so on. It's it's something that kind of resonates. And certainly, I think it's a good uh, title for this episode because it's sort of slightly, it's quite, it fits reasonably well. It's easy to remember which episode it is, but it's a little bit clever and it's kind of slightly doing... Uh, something beyond the obvious there. Yeah, I immediately can't help but think of it. When I think of Ship in a Bottle, um, when it comes to, to Star Trek, it's not the... Um, this episode, I always think of poor Joe Carey that we don't see for years and years and years in, in the current uh, mm. timeline, but we all, we end up being introduced to him again by creating a ship in a bottle, which he isn't able to complete and he gets killed when uh, he's doing yeah. it. So I, I am, that, that's where the, the tragedy goes for, for me when I think of a uh, ship in a bottle and, and Star Trek. It, I recently just rewatched this episode, but in the back of my mind, I think of the, the poor, poor Joe Carey. Tragedy to come. Definitely. Um, well, next up after that is back to DS9. It's captive pursuit. Now this is an interesting one, I think, because there, there's a slight sense of a kind of, um, a sort of oxymoron or a non sequitur there with the two words. I think, you know, pursuit suggests kind of freedom and, and being on the run captive, uh, obviously confined. And I think there's that weird sense in this episode. What it makes me think of is almost like, uh, you know, like trophy hunters who go and shoot animals that have essentially already been captured for them to do it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Where they can't really get away, where there's no, it's not even, I mean, not that I'm, I think it's much better people going and capture, you know, shooting genuinely wild animals, but somehow it does seem even worse that idea that you're going to go, uh, and, and 
hunt in this kind of fake way, basically, where they've made it as easy as possible for you. I don't know. It's, it, it, to me, it sort of conjures something slightly of that. Now, obviously, that's not exactly the case in the episode because they they do sort of want to make it as difficult for themselves as possible and so on. But I guess there's that sense that, you know, Tosk is both the hunted animal, but he's also the kind of prisoner, uh, which I suppose he is for a large proportion of the episode as well. Yeah, I, I like that sort of the contradiction in the, in the terms and so on. And um, yeah, I think it makes for sort of an interesting thing in sort of these these game hunters. I mean, ultimately, the pursuit is always quite, you know, maybe it comes back to another episode uh, that you've probably discussed previously, hollow pursuit. I mean, if you're trying to hunt something in a kind of an environment you see so many of these like as you see these game trophy hunters the reality is that they're uh, they're going to get bag some kind of prey and it's ultimately going to be quite a hollow pursuit to try and bag these things there's no there's no pride in hunting a, an elephant when you've got guns and cars and so on as well so yeah it, it's it's i like the the non sequitur in, in this one as well after that back to next gen with aquiel i don't think there's a huge amount to say about that i mean it's just the name of one of the characters in the uh fairly forgettable episode um then we have ds9 q less or q i suppose this is another one of these slightly tortured q puns uh sadly no alicia silverstone in this uh version of the story but um not a great q episode not a particularly great q title for my money though i suppose it does sort of just about work as a pun yeah it's one of those ones it's i remember sort of this title sort of i think like cupid etc so you know they all kind of get a bit misplaced but the fact that this was just the one of the only ones that got used in deep space nine means i do remember this this q title so for opposed to like q who and oh, oh god the cupid and um i can't even remember the one and even season one at the moment and so on but yeah it, it just stands out just for the fact that they only just use it the the one time in in deep uh, deep space nine for for kind of a good idea and a good way my i personally think that they could have pretty much got nicholas meyer's random title generator going for the q episodes i think <laughs> kind of just shoved in the word q and see you know see what words uh what words can come out of it and you sort of wonder you know if they'd if they kept writing q stories sort of ad infinitum i mean i guess in you know the novels there, there's a whole load of novels that feature q with kind of similarly uh jokey titles uh you know how far can you go you could um you, you could really be scraping the bottom of the barrel <laughs> by a certain yeah. point i mean there was a lot of uh discussion wasn't there about whether q might come back in the picard series and particularly when they were doing the short treks and they'd annu- at one point they'd announced that one of the short treks was going to be a Picard short trek and they hadn't announced which one it was. And then they put in a short trek called Q&A. And I think a lot of people thought, oh, wow, that could actually be, uh, you know, that would have been a good title for a Q episode. That, 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 that would be better than Q-less personally for my money. But, um, so far, and, and now it's taken, sadly, so they're not going to be able to do it uh, unless they, you know, just decide to pull an emissary or a past prologue and kind of use the same thing again. Um, next up, we've got uh, for next gen face of the enemy. I think that one's fairly uh, self-explanatory, um, unless you've got anything on that. No, I, I, when I saw that thing, I thought, you know, I wonder if that would be one of these kind of titles where it was like a kind of 70s thriller movie, some sort of like communist sort of like Manchurian candidate. And then you're like, face of the enemy, Google, Star Trek, Star Trek, oh, Battlestar Galactica, a little series, something to do with Harry Potter. I, I just thought like, oh, surely that's like, it's got, I think it's such a, a good title and so on. that I was surprised it hadn't been, been used for something a bit kind of more innovative. I know, I know. I'm just having another check because you made me question myself. But I don't think, well, here's, look, here's one for the Babel Conference. If anyone can point to a direct reference to this, uh, absolutely, I'd be very interested to hear it. But as far as I know, it is just, uh, you know, pretty decent Star Trek episode title. Uh, back to DS9 with Dax. Now, this is a great one. I actually love this because it's so, you could say this is the most kind of bald sort of Pillar Berman era uh descriptive title but actually when you come to think about it it sort of has hidden depths almost because it, it's so straightforward it's not even data's day or a fistful of data's or spock's brain or you know alman bashir or any of these other titles that kind of include the name of um one of the characters i think it is probably the only episode of star trek now correct me if i'm wrong that is literally just the name of one of the characters but of course 
what it's saying is it's not just, it's not just, I mean, it's partly saying this is the Dax episode here. You get to know about a bit more about Dax, one of our, you know, and all the characters are kind of getting their introductory episodes. We had Kira, we had Odo. Now this is the Dax one. But it's also, of course, making the point that this is not just an episode about Jadzia Dax. This is an episode about Dax and the Dax part of that kind of joined entity more than the Jadzia part, essentially. Um, so I actually think it's quite clever in a way, as straightforward and simple as it appears to be. That is a title is doing slightly more work than it seems to be. Yeah, and I, I wonder if it's one of these ones that it, it becomes sort of kind of one for that can always kind of go back to. I mean, we'll have Esri. This episode is equally a, a prequel to her sort of um, kind of character. Um, obviously, she's still six years away from arrival there's obviously the conjecture um about sort of the these upcoming kind of trill characters that we might be meeting in in star trek discovery season three is one of them could it be a dax potentially so it's one of those ones that as you say it's not jadzia dax it's dax the symbiont and that's a, a character that kind of has continued to live on in a couple of iterations so far will it kind of go for for a third iteration and sort of have even sort of more significance will be be interesting especially when you think of Discovery Season 3 if they do go down that route. This is like essentially sort of a, a sequel to that as well. So, um, And then it's also a kind of prequel mm-hmm. because they're now going off thousands of years into the future. So I'm very interested to see sort of how this episode potentially plays if if that theory comes to, to pass. Uh, I mean, they could literally just have another title called Dax if they wanted to. And that could be the big reveal. You know, yes, this character is Dax. Uh, and and then kind of play with that. I, I've seen a lot of people saying is this character Dax? Now, I don't know if we've ever been given a sense of how long-lived the Trills are. I sort of didn't assume that the symbiont was effectively immortal, which that might suggest if they're however many thousands of years in the future, is it really realistic that those symbionts are still kicking around? I I know lots of people love this idea that Dax might show up uh, as a sort of fan theory. I think I'd be more persuaded in a way of Dax showing up in strange new worlds since we know that there was a Dax around at that time. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, obviously we don't actually know a huge amount about the Trill, but I would be slightly surprised to discover that some of those symbionts are thousands of years old. Yeah, I, I, again, I suppose no one ever truly dies in, in science fiction, especially when you're sort of like a, a slug-like creature. You know, it's ultimately the, the hosts have their, their lifespan. But I always got the impression that these sorts of kind of um, symbionts they probably did have quite a significant kind of life because there was only so many of them. And it would be a case if, mm. if they weren't being sort of produced somewhere that, you know, obviously you had to be someone quite special and significant to, to, to take on one of these um, symbionts. So I, I can imagine a, a Dax symbiont being th- thousands of, of years old and, you know, it's there's not enough of these being created to, to kind of keep people kind of satisfied. But it means that, say, with Jadzia, we had a character with, what, like eight or nine lifetimes or so you, you, something in that kind of range. I guess, again, similarly, you, you know, keep sort of tying in with Doctor Who somehow. But I think there was an obvious parallel there with the Doctor and Doctor Who and having these like uh, past lives, essentially, uh, but on some level, fundamentally the same person. I feel it would have been different if Jadzia had had 50 previous hosts, that would have been a different phenomenon somehow do you know what i mean that would seem almost uh, but then again actually talking about doctor who they kind of done that in the most recent series of doctor who by saying that actually before well I don't, i'm not up on my doctor who law either before or within as a, but basically at some point you know in the he- history of the doctor there may have been unlimited extra regenerations that we have no idea about that have been you know all been conveniently forgotten about so who knows? Again, I suppose it raises these kind of questions. I mean, in Doctor Who, that because of the time travel and so on, the, the age is almost irrelevant. In Star Trek, obviously, it would have implications, You're certainly going backwards, because, you know, how long have the Trill been doing this kind of thing for? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know what we'll find out in Discovery Season 3. Um Maybe um, I slightly suspect it won't be a Dax, but you know, 
obviously I'll eat my hat if uh, <laughs> they start releasing the episode titles, maybe in the panel that's uh, taking place as we speak. Uh, they release the episode titles for season three and one of them is, you know, strongly hinting at Jax, then clearly uh, I'm in the wrong. And if, depending on when you release this episode, you can always just cut this part out. So, you know, we can make ourselves <laughs> look right, absolutely yeah. genius if it comes to pass. Yeah, just yeah, wait yeah. until it kind of gets to mid-season, those characters appear, and then just keep it in. <laughs> My God, how did those guys predict it? And if we didn't cut out, no one's to know any better. Yeah. And people will listen to us as Star Trek experts on a podcast. Absolutely. Our credibility will, will get a boost. Um, moving on, uh, Next Gen Tapestry. This, I think, is a lovely title. Uh, I quite like these episodes where the title just pulls out a small moment or a small line from the episode, a bit like the drumhead. I mean, I, I think I talked about this in the previous uh, episode on this topic, how that episode could have been called all kinds of things, you know, the witch hunt or, you, you know, whatever you want to call it. But but calling it the drumhead sort of picked up on this quite small moment, really, um, uh, as a, like a particular line and it focuses your attention on that line and on that moment. I suppose I think Tapestry, again, sort of similarly uh does the same thing by drawing your attention to this comment that Picard makes about, you know, rewriting his past being like pulling on the, the threads of the tapestry of his life. I mean, it's a beautiful line in itself. Uh, and then I think taking the title from it again, sort of uh, underlines it somehow. Yeah, we always think of even to this stage when we've seen evidence to kind of show otherwise that Picard isn't always hasn't always been the Picard that we know and love and sometimes may find a little bit cold and distant. I mean, that, that line, you know, there were, there were many parts of my youth that I'm not proud of. There were loose threads, untidy parts of me that I would like to remove. But when I pulled on one of those threads and raveled the tapestry of my life, and I think that is, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing. And I think the, for better or worse, Star Trek fans, We'll often kind of think about that, that tapestry of life. You know, we, we watch a lot of kind of Star Trek media where we kind of see how that smallest little change in, in the timeline can have huge kind of consequences. And I think this episode does it so well where this character that we love is sort of reduced to sort of this humble guy in a, a blue shirt, you know, not, you know, you know, low, lowly ranked, you know, the characters don't think much of him significantly, it, you know, when it comes to sort of looking at potential command opportunities. And you just think it just takes that one little moment that, that just changes everything. And I think maybe our Star Trek fans are a bit more kind of prone to thinking about that because we've been exposed to, to episodes like this and, and many of the others and sort of Star Trek's kind of rich history when it comes to, to playing with time and, um, you know, seeing the positives and negatives of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's certainly, it's something that is kind of resonant. The, the idea behind that line and behind that, that title, uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's an, it's a complicated and interesting idea. I suppose the episode is putting forward, uh, and it's one that, that kind of resonates through time. Um, next up, DS9, the passenger. Now, this one I had to look up is actually an Iggy Pop song. And the reason I think that's not a coincidence is that Morgan Gendel wrote this episode and Morgan Gendel was the one who wrote The Inner Light uh, and named it after a Beatles B-side and said he wanted to name all his Star Trek episodes after Beatles songs. Now, he didn't manage that, but the fact that this episode is named after another song, albeit not by the Beatles, uh, makes me think that is probably not a coincidence. Yeah, I think that's probably closer to uh, being a reality than, you know, there's the, the 1975 film, The Passenger, um, not much kind of in common with, with that. Um, you know, David Locke, played by Jack Nicholson, who assumes the identity of a dead businessman working on a documentary. Chad, in a way that he's impersonating an arms dealer with connections to the rebels in the Civil War. No, there, I, I don't think that there's much connection there, but I think you've got a bulletproof case there with uh, the Iggy Pop reference. And Iggy Pop is someone that we will we'll see in later Star Trek. So good times all around. He is. Who knows? Maybe that was part of the deal. You know, maybe that was that was one of the ways they talked him around. They were like, look, we even named an episode after your song. That's how much we love you. Uh, and as it turns out, Iris Stephen Bear, I think, was a, he is a massive uh, Iggy Pop fan. I think that's how Iggy Pop ended up on DS9 in a particularly memorable and, and brilliant cameo, I would say. Um, after that, we've got Birthright. Uh, I don't think there's a huge amount to say about that, except that I suppose the birthright refers to two characters at once in the, in, in that kind of typical next gen fashion. You've got the wolf storyline, which is all about his father and his family and so on. And then you've got the same for data, 
uh, I, I suppose the idea of a birthright, particularly, it, it, you know, is maybe more applicable to data's half of the story in some ways because um, there's this sense of something that is due to him almost uh, that's been passed down from his father that he's discovering about himself, that he's discovering something that is sort of intrinsically his. Now, Worf is discovering something slightly more uh, complicated. But I guess, you know, it's a, it's a title that at least hits both those stories to some extent. Yeah, we probably see a bit more in sort of the episode two, sort of about the Klingon birthright being denied to them. The, this idea that they're mm. hunters and warriors, that they aren't, mm. shouldn't be just sort of kicking around in sort of like a camp, that they should be out there, you know, pillaging and doing whatever kind of Klingons do. So I suppose, <laughs> the, the, stuff, yeah, yeah, it probably balances out over the, the, the period of the two. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Now, I, I, I suppose you're right. Maybe the birthright is more in a negative light. Uh, on the Klingon side of the story and more in a positive light for data. Um, I'm going to skip a few and jump ahead to another next gen episode. Um, Starship mine. I've always liked this title. I think it's a great title for an episode. I've never quite been sure what it actually refers to. Is it Starship mine? Uh, because Picard is laying booby traps and basically mining the enterprise or is it Starship mine as in, get off its mine <laughs> because there's sort of almost a sense of like, you know, it's Picard left alone on his ship. There's a real sense of kind of ownership. And uh, I, I don't know, he is, it, it is almost like home alone, isn't it? As well as, you know, people always liken it to Die Hard. but this sense of this is this guy in his home, his home has been invaded and he's got to get the invaders the hell out of his home. Uh, so I don't know. I, I've always sort of wondered, you know, is it mine as in belonging to me or is it mine as in something that, blows up in your face no i i think that you you're kind of right there there was um it's interesting when i was kind of this is my good thing so obviously morgan gendel it was in um involved in this one um so all the, the all this episode often compared to die hard morgan gendel denies the connection Um it was not about it's kind of talking about it as a die hard that's somebody else's work it's an idea we've seen countless times and other things but this is where it kind of gets interesting. So this is thanks to, to Memory Alpha. So Gendo revealed that he had initially called the story Revolution after the Beatles song of the same name. That was an in-joke because he'd previously named the Inner Light after the B-side to Lady Madonna. In this case, the producers overrode his choice that it was too similar to the title of Evolution. So um, th- there's no sort of idea where they came from, but we were so close to having something called Revolution, which I don't really sort of see kind of resembling in sort of the, the episode title itself and then um, you know revolution evolution i mean if they're complaining that those episode titles are too similar we've already had uh, the emissary emissary so uh, yeah you can't help but have a little chuckle there yes most of the letters are the same but the words carry such different meanings that seems like an odd seems like an odd objection really you can really imagine star trek revolution being i mean Insurrection could have been called that. That, that so- sounds like a sort of nineties uh, Star Trek movie, or so could Nemesis. Frankly, uh, you, you know, Star Trek Revolution might might be a good one. The next episode after that is Lessons. Now, again, I think there might be a little bit of a double meaning there because obviously this is an episode which is sort of about I was going to say about music lessons. They're not exactly lessons, but there's a sort of feeling of the music lessons. But I think more fundamentally is the lessons for Picard. Um, lessons in love, lessons in loss, you, you, you know, these kind of, um, but it's interesting, I suppose, by calling it that, by framing it in that way, it does sort of suggest what is, it suggests something that's changing. And I think this is one of those key episodes for Picard as a character where there is real kind of character development in a sense. And there is a real uh, continuity. There is real, not exactly, maybe not serialization, but there is picking up on you know, those threads, those strands of his tapestry and, and weaving the next bit with them and, you know, bringing back the Resican flute and bringing back the events of the inner light and giving this sense that this is someone who, you know, as much as Picard might seem like this quite already perfected, evolved human being who we all aspire to, he's someone who can kind of learn and change and grow, you, you know, even now and who can be affected by experiences that we've seen him have in ways that change him going forward. 
I think it's a really interesting one as well to sort of just look at the kind of the run of Star Trek episodes that we've just discussed as well, where I was, I'm, I don't know if you listened to it as well, but obviously the, the Delta Flyers podcast with Robert Duncan McNeil and Garrett Wang. And there was the chat about sort of non sequitur, which is this sort of big Harry King episode, Harry Kim episode where he gets a bit of action. He gets a, you know, gets a lady, you know, all these sorts of things. And he was like, I'd gone, gone to Brandon Bragg. I was like, I just want something to do. I want to get my kind of, you know, get stuck into something, you know, a bit of action, a bit of adventure, a bit of romance, you know, which I think most of these people have had these kind of conversations with uh, in Star Trek. They're going, I just give me something. I mean, who can forget sort of the classic one about Captain Picard has to get laid when he has to go on his captain's holiday. Um, but then you look at these episodes here that we've got, we have tapestry, you know, the young Picard, you know, learning on his life, Starship Mine, action adventure Captain Picard which would become a lot more prevalent in the movies when Patrick Stewart had a lot more sway and influence and then something like Lessons where Captain Picard is going to get sort of his action kind of going and find some some romance I mean even into the next episode that we'll kind of talk on in a, a few moments time The Chase he gets to be sort of the Indiana Jones character I would love to know what ca- conversation Patrick Stewart had early or mid season six with, with the writers to get this run of episodes to you know of like I want to do this I want to do this I want to do this it, it, it was certainly quite interesting especially when you think like contracts coming up for for final seasons and so on um, it's i never sort of pick, put those run of episodes quite together like that until we spoke about them that is an interesting point i'd never really thought of it like that but you're right back to back starship mine and lessons is they're so different they're such different sides of picard's personality um and yet both great episodes in their own right yeah that is a really interesting that is an interesting point. I mean, I think we tend to think of, you know, um, Captain's Holiday as the result of that memo, uh, or that letter that, that Patrick Stewart wrote and that lunch that he had. Um, but I think you're right. You can see the strands of that going forward and certainly going into the movies. I mean, you know, kind of action Picard of the movies is, is almost a sort of extension of that version of Picard that Stewart seemed to want to, to bring in a little bit more. And obviously in the movies, he was much more heavily involved in the kind of, uh, the creative decisions. I mean, if you read Michael Pillar's book about insurrection, you know, Patrick Stewart is one of the ones kind of weighing in and saying, no, I don't like this. I don't like that. I need you to do this for my character, do that for the character, you know, push him in this direction. I'm not interested in doing the tortured stuff again. Uh, I want to have fun. I want it to be kind of an action adventure, basically. Um, I wonder whether part of that is, you know, maybe that part of that, maybe just Patrick Stewart kind of wanting to have a bit of fun. I sort of wonder whether it was also him worrying about being a bit typecast and, you know, playing, if you think about like after Next Gen, obviously he went on to play Professor Xavier in the X-Men movies, who is a very similar character, uh, frankly, you know, very cerebral, very kind of authoritative, very calm, measured, uh, you, you know, almost it sort of felt in those certainly in the next gen movies, but also with, you know, maybe in the series as well, that Patrick Stewart really wanted to say, look, I can do more than that. I don't have to just be this kind of slightly stuffy guy on the bridge who's always right and, you know, always decent. I can kind of do a little bit more. I've got more range than that, basically. I can play this character slightly differently. Yeah, I think so as well. And I think when you, you do a show for, for six years, you're, you're clamoring for, for a lot of different things to do. I mean, I think season six, you know, you, you also had Chain of Command as well. And, um, you know, it, I think it was a fantastic kind of year for, for Patrick Stewart in the, the role of Picard for sure. The next one that jumps out at me is Frame of Mind, just because I think it's quite a clever title insofar as I think, unless I misremember, Frame of Mind is the title of the play within the episode that Riker is acting in. And therefore, by calling the Star Trek episode Frame of Mind, it's almost playing the same game, the same slightly sadistic game that's being played on Riker in the episode of being unclear what reality are we in? You know, is the play real? Is the Enterprise real? Uh, you know, uh, what, what's the kind of final box, if you know what I mean, within which everything takes place. And by naming the episode itself after the fictional play within a, uh, TV show, I was going to say play within a play, but you, you know, sort of the fiction within a fiction, it sort of almost emphasizes that slight blurring of, of boundaries and that slight kind of playing with 
uh, what's real and you, you know what level of reality are we yeah and you think of it you're you know we should have got your your old pal Brandon Braga back on to to talk about this one I mean obviously he he spoke about that the he was desperate f- uh, for stories when he came up with the idea for this episode that um, the the bare bones of the idea bit around what if Riker woke up in an insane asylum and I suppose it all goes back to the, that right frame of frame of mind you know the the kind of the um, you know, the, how people's moods and influences can be done and so on. And, you know, people that are often detained sort of under things like the Mental Health Act in quote unquote insane asylums um, would sort of people that would not be obviously in the, the right frame of frame of mind and would be sort of legally kind of confirmed as such. Is there also a sense maybe that, you know, of being framed either, you know, either framed for a crime, which is kind of what's going on in the episode on one level, uh, but also just a frame. So, so a frame being something that's associated with, um, you know, misattributing criminal behavior to someone, but also, like I say, this idea of these kind of boxes within boxes frames, I don't know, it's sort of an image of like, a, a, as well as obviously the metaphor of, you, you know, it's a common saying frame of mind. I just what I feel like it sort of slightly suggests this idea of like, there are these other meanings sort of, um, lurking underneath possibly uh in a way that is quite appropriate for this kind of episode when you think of it as well you've got um beverly crusher directing kind of riker and so on you know framing you know on on the stage and you know with sort of the the mind's camera and so on like that on the stage so you know there's, there's probably an element of that in terms of the the framing of the the play kind of you know physically i guess now, next up, we've got a DS9 episode, Progress. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say about this, except that I think it's a brilliantly DS9 episode title in that it's sort of bitterly ironic. You know, this idea that, that yeah, this is progress, and yet it's not a good thing. You would think progress in Star Trek was going to be something great. This is actually a pretty depressing episode, in a way, about someone who doesn't who, who wants to kind of stand in the way of progress, in a way, and the sense that progress is a bad thing. Uh, in this man's life because it's kind of destroying everything that he holds dear. We probably see that a lot kind of in, you know, you, you think of the, the kind of nineties as well, you know, a lot of kind of, especially in sort of American manufacturing and probably here in the, the UK as well, being sent to sent abroad, you know, kind of, you know, being converted into you know different things um you know and it, it leaves these kind of people as a society kind of advances forward, you know, people are ultimately kind of left behind in, in the name of progress. Now, the next one I had highlighted is uh, one, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Lee, this episode when I, I had to look it up, but apparently is a Scottish proverb dating from the 1620s, if wishes were horses. Uh, had you heard of this one? If wishes were horses, beggars would ride is the uh, full um, proverb there. No, I, I I hadn't been familiar with it being a, being a Scottish one. So there we go. Um, you've got you've got one, an expert involved at last and he's come up short. <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but it's an interesting, uh, that's a proper kind of literary, uh, or cultural kind of illusion there in a, in a DS9 episode, I think. And, and something we'll see certainly coming back more into the kind of episode titles, I think, as we go on, um, with DS9. Uh, kind of similarly jumping ahead a little bit, Dramatis Personae. Um, the Dramatis Personae is the list of characters, um, that you get at the start of a play, you know, who's going to be playing what role. Uh, it's a, a phrase that comes originally from the ancient Greek theatre. Um, in this episode, it's, I suppose, this idea that, you know, everyone is kind of possessed and, play, you know, everyone is sort of playing roles that are not their own. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of that line in, um, must be in Crossover, I think. One, one of the DS9 Mirror episodes anyway, where someone says, oh, it's like the players are all the same, but everyone's playing a different part. Yeah, it's one of those things, I suppose, that kind of possession kind of thing. I, I, um, and, you know, kind of playing these roles, Star Trek loves kind of the, the possession kind of title. So I imagine a title like this was going to come up sooner rather than later, especially when you think of kind of a lot of these Star Trek actors um, have kind of theatre backgrounds as well. And um, yeah, it's one of the, it, this is the first this is quite a significant one as well. This is the first of 11 Star Trek episode titles where the titles are derived from, from Latin. So, you know, I'm surprised it's taken. Where are we at? Um, 
274 episodes in you know what you think of star trek loves a, a kind of latin title so this was the first and then we have sub rosa ex post facto non sequitur alter ego into arma silent legus terra nova vox sola c vis peckham para belum eta arco ergo one and two so yeah i i'm stunned that this was the the first time to to use uh, to use latin and trek I, I i'm stunned now, after that, we have another really interesting episode title, I think, uh, and a wonderful episode, Duet. Now, I love this title because it suggests to me something about the kind of episode that they're going for, insofar as it's not its not a title that actually describes the content of the episode at all, really. What it does is it describes the kind of format of the episode, in a sense, in that this is really a very intimate, very small-scale approach to this big historical, uh, you know, this, this huge topic in a sense of the occupation and the kind of um, trauma of that and the kind of cruelty and the brutality and the war crimes and all of this stuff. But the fact that it's going to be handled on this very small level, it's kind of, you know, it's a piece of chamber music. It's not a kind of big orchestral piece. Um, so it feels like it's sort of almost a kind of statement of intent saying we're going to do this and we're going to do it as a two-hander. We're going to do it as a duet. Um and I suppose it also suggests something about the two participants being sort of equally, sort of, you know, almost equal and opposite or something. It's about the fact that it's it's a piece of music that can only be played by them working together somehow. There's there's something of, of that in there as well, that, you know, as much as Kira and the Cardassian start off as kind of enemies and opponents, that somehow the story is going to come out of the two of them interacting um, in this very dramatic and uh, effective way. And I suppose sometimes you think of like the, the duality of sort of Star Trek episodes. You have the A plot and the B plot. There is no B plot to be had here. It is just these two kind of characters kind of facing off with each other. And it, it does evoke for me sort of the, the theatrical thing. Like I can imagine going to see a play about sort of, you know, these kind of themes, whether it's sort of like, uh, obviously it's, it's the plot's been slightly inspired by the man in the glass booth, um, a sort of Jewish man accused of a Nazi war crime. Um, so it's, it's interesting to sort of, you know, I, I get sort of that very theatrical kind of impression from, from the title. I think, ooh, this is going to be a, a good one for, for the actors. And I think this is probably, you know, Harris Yell and, and, um, Nano Visitor is definitely one of their kind of finest hours. Now, next up after that, I've got Timescape. I put this on the list just because I looked up the title and I don't understand uh, what I found. So I'd be interested if anyone can explain it. Uh, when I looked up the word Timescape, what I get is um, a function of time that is dependent on the position of the observer. I don't know what that means. I don't know about you. It makes me think of something like the movie Interstellar. It sounds quite kind of heavy science. I'm kind of curious, what was Brannon Braga thinking? I should have asked him if I'd, you know, been preparing ahead. Uh, why is this episode called Timescape? What exactly does that mean? Obviously, it's about time, but there's so many Star Trek episodes about time. I guess they all have to, uh, they all have to have titles that allude to that uh, in one way or another, uh, or at least many of them do. Um, what is a timescape exactly? Is it like a landscape in time? Is it, uh, I mean, what, what, what I think of when I think of that episode is that first of all, that th there are certain kind of images that jump out at you, like Picard with his hand frozen in the fruit and all that sort of thing. But there's also, I suppose, this very, uh, resonant image of the Enterprise frozen mid battle and this idea of everything being frozen in time somehow. Maybe, maybe that's sort of what it's getting at is it's like time is frozen. Time is like a, is like a landscape is kind of, um, it, it, you know, I suppose there is this sense, that, talking about the observer, it being dependent on the position of the observer. I suppose, I suppose that does actually kind of hit it insofar as time is moving at one speed for the observers that we're with, the ones who are on the runabout, and a different speed for the ones who are experiencing it on the Enterprise, in a sense. Uh, so the idea that time is moving at a different speed for different people. Um, but anyway, it's a slightly mysterious one. Yeah, I can imagine it's sort of this multi-dimensional view. You think of it, you have people frozen in time, you have people sort of moving up above it, sort of people that are, I think there was 
some was it some sort of creature i can't remember off the top of my head in terms of what was in sort of the warp core so they're in their own dimensions you can sort of imagine something like this being sort of a in a star trek term that four dimensional chess or, or whatever it was was it three dimensional i, I, 3D I can't chess, remember 4d yeah. or 3d whatever star trek was known for when it came to to chess sets yes yeah, so that's the one so you can sort of see it with all these different elements of where everyone is at time but within the same sort of of space there's some up some down and um, but they're all kind of inhabiting the same physical space i guess after that we've got in the hands of the prophets now this is an interesting one i think because again ds9 is going for the religious uh title i mean they're not it's not an episode called you know uh something about the wormhole aliens they're actually using the kind of religious terminology on the other hand i feel there's something slightly ironic about it again uh because it's a pretty bleak episode in many ways it's quite a cynical episode insofar as we have win using this situation for political advantage allying herself with uh some pretty nasty people and yet being this kind of sanctimonious preachy uh you know religious figure who um you know would use phrases like these so i suppose it's an interesting one it's kind of invoking the religious language but it's almost doing it slightly ironically in the same way as maybe progress was kind of uh using that word ironically it's kind of there's there's something bitter about the 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 the, the seemingly positive optimistic you know not exactly utopian but i mean if if we expect star trek to be a kind of vision of of a positive future what ds9 seems to keep doing is presenting these things that sound like they're going to be and then actually uh are quite the opposite yeah, and it's, it's ultimately we'll we'll see it that the future of our characters, as much as they like to think they're in control of their um, fate and own destiny, it is often out of what you know. You think of sort of the prophet's intervention and sacrifice of um, angels, and then sort of with Cisco's own own destiny as well. You know, there's there's a lot of things that these characters they may think they're you know they're in charge of their own destiny. The reality is is very much different to that. Jumping back to next gen, we have the two-parter Descent. Now, this is an interesting one because I sort of wonder, is this about Descent as in kind of heredity and your descent from your ancestors and, and, you know, sort of bloodlines, that sort of thing? Is it the idea of Descent as in something fallen, Uh, you know, a kind of fallen angel or something like that? I mean, have, have the Borg descended? Is what, what does it actually mean because i'm not 100 percent. obviously it's quite a memorable episode but i'm not totally clear what you know what descent are we really talking about here is this something to do with data or something to do with law or something to do with the borg or hugh or what I, I always thought I always thought of it sort of the the planet, for example. I mean, you sort of look up the classic dictionary definition, and I wouldn't have considered this one myself. It talks about, as you touch on, lineage. Um, but then one of the ones here is um, one of the six definitions of it is a sudden raid or hostile attack, which. I wouldn't sort of associate with dissent myself, but that's what um, dictionary.com would say. And you think of how this whole episode kind of kickstarts with that very aggressive sort of Borg attack um, and how it kind of uh, provokes data down a, a very interesting kind of path with his uh, emotions and so on. But personally, I always thought of it, you know, outside of lineage as well was that all this sort of action takes place down on a planet. And, um, you know, that you have the entire Enterprise crew end up on this kind of, you know, Borg kind of planet, sort of, you know, the antics are taking place down there, you know, while there's a very kind of limited crew, you know, in the heavens, as it were. So, you know, it, it's usually sort of kind of all the action adventure takes place in space. This takes place on a planet. But I was I was very surprised by sudden raid or hostile attack. I'd, I would never have used that in a sentence myself where someone asked me to, to use dissent. No, that's an interesting one. Well, I mean, again, one for the Babel conference. If anyone else has any thoughts on what they've always taken that one to mean uh i'd be interested to hear it. i'd be interested to know whether and there's there's another episode coming up uh in a bit that i i actually canvassed some thoughts on twitter because i was curious what other people thought that it referred to um we'll get to that in a little bit um right jumping ahead a little bit the next one i had marked up was gambit uh i don't have much to say about that except that it's such a kind of action heavy it almost could have an exclamation mark uh on it gambit and i guess that is what we get this is picard again in sort of action movie mode uh you know undercover and his leathers 
Um, and it's such a kind of action heavy title. I think it's, uh, it, it sort of sells what it's going to do there somehow. Yeah. And I, I think when you, again, sort of looking at sort of the, the de- dictionary definition of these sort of one word titles, any maneuver by uh, which one seeks to gain an advantage. I think that kind of really does sum up quite well the, the character kind of dynamic on that, that spaceship with when they're all kind of playing off against Galen and then sort of the chess move as well, where you think of it an opening in which a player seeks to obtain some advantage by sacrificing a pawn or a piece you know essentially captain picard has sacrificed you know this character you know by you know captain picard himself he takes on this character of of galen sort of to um you know at the expense of you know captain picard and everything that he can do as a a starfleet captain to kind of get to the bottom of this um this situation with the these kind of band of pirates really so yeah i think the you know the chess move and sort of the dictionary definition seem to to line up quite well um, next up, I've got invasive procedures. Now, I just thought this was quite an interesting one because this is the one where the Dax symbiont is removed from Jadzia. I suppose it emphasises the physical, the, the the sort of slightly horrific physical side of it. I also think it's interesting that it's a kind of phrase taken from contemporary medical terminology. And we get that again later on in the episode Life Support, which... Uh, even more than this one. I mean, I mean, this one involves a little bit of like sci-fi uh, kind of magic stuff insofar as it's about the trill and all of that business. Life support even more so is this kind of slightly Frankenstein-y story about Beryl being, uh, having bits of his brain replaced and everything and, and is he a human anymore? And this, you know, so it goes in a sort of sci-fi direction, but picks a title which places it very much in the modern contemporary medical context. So talking about life support, uh, in that episode, and you know, you might think of switching off the life support machine. Um, I just think it's interesting, these DS9 episodes that seem to sort of, particularly in these kind of medical storylines, they're getting away from the sort of magic science of Star Trek where everyone just gets fixed instantly and they're kind of locating it a little bit more in the real world, uh, of medical procedures somehow. The, the kind of thing that McCoy and, um, uh, the voyage home would probably be horrified about, you know, talking about invasive procedures. Probably they probably don't do invasive procedures anymore in the 24th century on the whole. I always think of it as well, sort of it potentially as this double meaning beyond sort of the what happens with with Dax it would be the sort of the takeover of the the station as well. That sort of you know in, in, you know invasion invasive invasion and sort of this you know procedure. Yeah, so I, I think there's there's certainly a double meaning there. The next one I had up is Cardassians. Now, again, I think this is a bit of an ironic title because on one hand, you could say, okay, this is an episode all about Cardassians. But the central question really about the boy Rugal is, is he a Cardassian or not? You know, who counts as a Cardassian? Is he Cardassian or is he Bajoran? So again, I suppose it's almost one that could have a question mark tacked on the end of it. You know, just like you could have had progress instead of progress. You know, this is Cardassians, are they? You know, who, who are the Cardassians? Uh do you know what I mean? Who counts as a Cardassian, I suppose, is the fundamental question here. Yeah, I think you, you've got a kind of really good point with that one, yeah. Um, Phantasms, this was another Braga episode. I didn't pick this up with him, but when I looked into it, Phantasm is actually the name of a horror movie. So that could well be, uh, <laughs> given that, as we know, you know, this is a, st- a story with some horror elements and that he was absolutely, well, it remains a big, big horror fan. Uh, I wonder whether that... Um, that movie might have played into it. I don't know anything about it. I don't know if you've seen the movie Phantasm, but I suspect if anyone's seen it, Brandon Braga's probably seen yeah, it. Yeah, you think of it with, you know, Brandon Braga, if anyone listened to your, your chat with him, you know, he knows his, his horror and, and you know, kind of pulls from it. I mean, I, I was randomly watching a Cold Fire today and it, you know, flew over my head as a, a young fan watching Voyager, but as an adult, this young demonic character called Suspiria, you know, it takes on a different meaning when you watch the Dario Argento um, movie and then obviously there's been the recent remake um so yeah this is you you there's certain things where you see a title and you go i know who kind of had that one and that was a, a brand of braga hour and it's interesting because that's an episode that's not it's not a horror episode exactly but it definitely has horror elements and i suppose the title slightly draws attention to that aspect of the episode um, quite different, uh, the next, uh, next, next gen episode that I had marked down, Dark Page. I suppose this is just alluding to the idea we have later on in Voyager, the quotation from Dante about the book of my memory. Uh, you know, there's the episode Latent Image where the doctor is, um, uh, Janeway gives the, the doctor 
copy of La Vita Nuova to look at. And there's this idea of the, the book of memory. I suppose the dark page is the, you know, is the dark page of the book where the sort of suppressed memory is, um, is kind of concealed, uh, d- dark insofar as it's occluded, but also dark insofar as it's unhappy. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's interesting. I suppose you, you think of it off the back of something like, uh, phantasms, you know, very, very interesting in terms of the kind of the, the horror and kind of, you know, elements of it. You know, there's ultimately there's a dead child at the heart of this, which is, it's quite brave kind of for, for Star Trek in the, the early nineties on a, a very family friendly show where you can imagine families are sat around the TV and there's someone that's mourning the death of a, a young child in a, a drowning accident, which is, it's not something that could be like, Oh, that's fantasy or, you know, Oh, that alien got her or something like that. It's like that could happen day to day, you know, with someone and a, a young dog or something, for example. Next next gen uh is attached, which I suppose, you know, maybe there's a slight double mint there. They're kind of attached mentally, but they're also they were attached already. Um after that I've got DS9 Necessary Evil. Again, I think I mean this is a great title, and again it's a very sort of quintessentially DS9 title. It's another one that could almost have a question mark on the end. You know, is it a, ne- you know, what do you consider a necessary evil? Kind of is evil ever necessary? It sort of raises all these complex moral questions it goes into kind of quite uh gray areas in a sense i think also the fact that it's not a necessary evil but necessary evil somehow makes it seem more sinister because it sort of gives this sense of like pervasive evil somehow it's not just uh, it's not just the one incident somehow it almost feels uh like it cuts deeper than that somehow it's it's more of a you know it's about necessary evil that is a phenomenon in life in you know particularly in the context of the occupation and so on you know sometimes maybe sometimes it is necessary to do things that are gray that are bad but to say it's necessary to do things that are evil is even going further i mean you know we talk about the lesser of two evils these kind of ideas but i suppose it's it's quite a again slightly bleak slightly dark it's slightly kind of uh provocative title i suppose i always think of it there's a, a line in sort of the the dark knight rises you know decades to come after this where you know a character goes to 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 the bane this big villain you are pure evil and he goes no i'm necessary evil and i think you could imagine something like that going with someone like gold cat who he doesn't consider himself himself evil he's he's stunned that people don't think that th- that there's not statues of him up on Bejor that people are, are worshiping and and falling and kind of lying about or sort of romanticizing the occupation i mean it comes back to so many times especially in his conversations with um with Kira over the years of like he he is absolutely delusional about his his role in it and he viewed himself as probably quite necessary in terms of what he did or you know he might have been evil but hey, I wasn't kind of pure evil, you know, things could have been worse for you people on the, you know, um, the, the plants or, you know, I looked after these women and so on like that. You know, he had a very deluded aspect of what he um, thought of himself. He he probably thought of himself as quite necessarily, whereas probably every Bajoran under the sun thought of himself as, as pure evil. Mm, absolutely. I, mean, I suppose these are the kind of questions that DS9 raises, you know, as the story goes on. And this is one of those first episodes that emphasizes that sort of slight moral ambiguity or uh, well i guess we we had it in duet as well but you, you know that kind of sense of the murkiness of this uh this history this past that's prologue and uh, you know that the, the there aren't going to be kind of easy answers there necessarily there are going to be difficult questions um after that we've got the next gen episode force of nature now this is kind of an interesting one because it's not really about a force of nature insofar as it, you know as that as that uh phrase is understood but it is about nature and it is about people using force to protect nature i suppose in that it's about environmental terrorists so it's it's one that is slightly i suppose it's kind of a pun uh or a sort of play on words um insofar as it's you know again another one of these ones that's so sort of using a well-known phrase but slightly twisting it or turning it on its head yeah exactly and you think of it sort of the the idea that you know 
na- is beyond sort of the, the force of nature, a, a mighty nature force which is beyond human control, nobly and potentially um, catastrophic, such as the elements, the storms. And you, you think of sort of these these ships, you know, jetting around, sort of they leave this like kind of wake and so on. You know, I can I can certainly see sort of how people might kind of draw those kind of parallels. Uh, speaking of parallels, the next one I had up is TNG episode parallels. What I love about this is it makes the whole concept seem very mundane, just calling it parallels, which makes you think of, you, you know, as you just used it in conversation, you know, parallels between this and that. It sort of uh, reduces the idea of this multiverse, which is a, a, a both wondrous and slightly horrifying concept, a uh, big, big science fiction concept. It sort of takes it down to the most mundane level, uh, which in some ways I suppose the episode does in that it has this interest in, you know, which prize did Worf win? Did he get a birthday cake or not? You know, all these kind of mundane questions somehow. Um, I just think it's also, it's like, a, it's such a next gen title for that episode, which you can imagine if the original series had done it or DS9 had done it, they'd have come up with something probably quite flowery and kind of elaborate uh, or, or like with discovery with magic to make the sanest go- man go mad if you think of that compared to something like parallels it's like it's it's almost deliberately underplaying it as much as possible how wacky and wild this uh the the, the kind of sci-fi concept we're going to see on the screen is yeah, and I think it's something that just, as I say, it's just something that's nice and simple that just plays on it, especially when you, you see, like, the scope of all these different parallel universes that we see from kind of, you know, different command positions to the Borg or kind of rampage the Federation. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting one where it just, it says what it does on the tin and it, as a fan, you sort of think, oh, whenever you sort of think of Star Trek, you know, sort of parallel universes and so on, it always immediately stands out of like, oh, that's an episode I'm potentially interested in. Now, the next one I had highlighted was the alternate. This one is a bit of a puzzle to me because the mystery of this episode is who is rampage, who or what is sort of rampaging around the station. And the answer to that mystery is it's Odo and it's his kind of alter ego. Does calling it now the, the there is an episode, I think, of Voyager called Alter Ego that will be coming up in a while, but by calling it the alternate, which sort of on the face of it, it's not very clear what it refers to, but gradually you sort of realise that's what it's saying. Does it give away the answer to this mystery? Do you, do you know what I mean? Uh, for someone watching it for the first time, and I can't remember watching this episode for the first time, uh, so I, I, I can't speak from personal experience, but it's a weird one because it seems to me that it slightly gives away the answer to the question that the episode is asking, or at least strongly hints at the answer to it. Yeah, I never sort of considered that one before, but yeah, it, it annoyingly plays plays the hand of it. So yeah, it would be a you know mm-hmm. because otherwise, what does it mean? Do you know what I mean? And, and maybe it's just one of those episodes you're you're going to watch and you're going to think, well, why on earth did they call it that? And you kind of forget about it, and then at the end you'll think, oh yeah, okay, that makes. Sense. Now we know why they decided to hide the thing. titles for for Picard and Discovery episodes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Avoid any spoilers. Um, Okay, the next one I had uh, underlined was Armageddon Game. It reminds me very much of the original series episode, A Taste of Armageddon. And again, there's that kind of ironic element, you know, a taste, a game. Uh, it's sort of sounds like it's not very taking it very seriously. It's also, I had to look this up. Um, it is a, a actual expression, Armageddon Game. It's a type of high speed chess game, apparently, uh, which is played very fast and where it's not possible for there to be a draw between the two sides. Now, in the context of this story that's about a kind of... They're not nuclear weapons, they're kind of biological weapons and a sort of military stalemate and the kind of... You know, it's sort of at least feels like it's sort of in the realm of, like, nuclear uh, proliferation and peace talks and getting rid of weapons and all these sorts of things. I think it's kind of interesting that it is actually a phrase that refers to a form of chess where it's not possible to have a stalemate, basically, where... Um, there are special rules in play that mean that one or the other has to come out on top and obliterate the opponent, essentially. I need to refresh my knowledge of uh, chess. That one completely flew me by. I just thought one of those ones, it's like Armageddon game. That, I remember sort of as a kid seeing, I remember borrowing a, a video from a friend and uh, seeing that as an episode title and it immediately sounded more exciting than actually the reality of it was. It sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? It sounds like there's going to be a lot of, uh, yeah, action, adventure. Yeah, yeah, and, and maybe that's not quite what you get. I, I quite like that episode, but you're right. It's not, maybe it's overselling it in that instance. Um, 
Next up is Sub Rosa, which you mentioned, one of those Latin titles. Sub Rosa meaning under the rose, referring to a secret. Uh, but also I sort of wonder if there's, again, a kind of allusion there to, you know, there's a lot of stuff about burying bodies and graves and stuff. You know, is, is what's under the rose, under the flowers, actually a dead body, essentially? I think there's also probably in terms of if you, you think about it under the rose, you know, under the, the romance side of being buried with, you know, affection and, and romance and so on. I, I can maybe imagine there's an element of that in this sort of lovey dovey episode. <laughs> lovey dovey. If your idea of romance is a kind of, uh, crazy sex candle thing. But yeah, absolutely. Um, whispers, slightly mundane, uh, title again there. Um, Next Generation episode, Lower Decks. Now, of course, this is another one of these ones that uh, is now a series, just like Strange New Worlds, just like, um, you know, we get these kind of shows that are riffing on previous uh, episode titles. Now, I haven't seen this episode for a little while. I don't think anyone in the episode uses the phrase Lower Decks, as far as I can remember. It's sort of understood Lower Decks refers to these junior crew but it's interesting in the series Lower Decks, they're shouting like Lower Decks, Lower Decks. You, you know, it's like Lower Decks has become an identity. It's become, it's sort of become in universe as opposed to just a way of, of referring to them in the title. Unless I'm wrong there and there's a scene that I've forgotten about where they describe themselves as being on the Lower Decks. But it's kind of, I suppose it's also, it's kind of, it's kind of literalizing. They're lower in that they're lower down the rung, uh, you, you know, down the hierarchy. Um, again, in Lower Decks, it's kind of literalised to the point where, uh, I can't remember where on the ship they're located, but they're like, um, the fact that they don't have proper quarters, the fact, do you, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's emphasised much more even than in the Next Gen episode. In the Next Gen episode, it feels like they're just, they're only lower in so far as they're at the start of their careers, really. They're very, they're junior. Whereas in Lower Decks, I think there's more a sense, not only are they junior, but they're kind of look down on they're kind of slightly downtrodden they're slightly almost kind of mistreated do you know what i mean there's a slight sense that they're they're being kind of taken advantage of or or sort of used i suppose in the kind of way of makes me think of like uh I, i guess because it's a sort of workplace uh comedy in a sense and there is that idea i mean obviously next gen to some extent was a workplace comedy but it was about the higher the higher ups in the workplace, the sort of executive level. These are the ones who, you know, if it weren't for the utopian post scarcity society of the Federation, these are the ones who are just doing it to, you know, pay the bills at the end of the week. If you know what I mean, do you know what I mean? It's like kind of, um, they're, they're, they're at the bottom of the ladder. They're kind of, they're the ones we can relate to because they're the ones who have to put up with, uh, it's almost like horrible bosses. Do you know what I mean? They're having to sort of put up with, with crappy leadership in a sense. Um, very un-Star Trek in a way. But I think, I think it's interesting the title Lower Decks with the TV show. I feel like that they've taken, you know, obviously they've taken the next gen title, but they've also kind of run with that, what that might mean in a way that isn't, it almost isn't in the episode itself. In a way. Yeah, it's a badge of honour. I mean, even though in this lower decks, the most of the characters sort of are involved in sort of going onto the bridge, you know, two of them uh, especially get sort of some involvement in there, whereas that's not something we kind of see with this current kind of lower decks kind of crew. So I, I, I can imagine something like lower decks being so inspiring. I mean, I, rem- I remembered when they announced Discovery, where it was like, it's not going to focus on the captain, it's going to focus on someone a bit lesser in command. I was like, oh, are they kind of going to go for sort of a, a lower deck style vibe, which is never was sort of kind of the case or kind of failed a little bit in the execution. Whereas obviously Lower Decks, the TV show very much kind of takes the inspiration from this episode and makes it a a real badge of honor. Whereas a lot of these characters that we've seen in Lower Decks, they're embracing sort of that kind of ground that they're in. Whereas in this one, they're looking to to get ahead and advance and um, taking different opportunities. After that, I've got um, another one of these DS9 ironic episode titles paradise i mean probably the most bitterly ironic of these ones that we've had so far you know this planet that's supposedly paradise but in fact is a real uh kind of a hellhole you know cisco is literally you know shoved in this box and and kind of uh brutalized in a way um and of course the idea of paradise is something that will come up in ds9 again uh in the marquee which is you know not 
a huge distance away from this episode. Then again, in Paradise Lost, uh, for DS9, I suppose, Paradise is not possible. And I guess that's the big departure from Next Gen. You know, Next Gen appeared to exist pretty much within Paradise, uh, it, it, broadly speaking, in this sort of very utopian uh, universe. DS9 seems to really question the idea of Paradise to the extent that they'll call an episode Paradise when it's, you know, very blatantly about almost the opposite, about kind of um, abuse and kind of uh, this, you know, really unpleasant situation that has arisen off the back of, again, these kind of ideals that have been sort of corrupted in a way, Um, you know, maybe with the best intentions, but they've ended up in this really nasty, unpleasant place. Yeah, it's an easy to be a be a saint in in paradise, and you know that's certainly something that doesn't apply apply here when you've got things like punishment boxes, for example. So, yeah, it's it's you know as I say, it's something a, a title that fine on its own merits, but then becomes enhanced by what's to come, um, kind of somewhat unintentionally, I suspect. Back to next gen and back to Hamlet with thine own self. Uh, this above all else. This above all. What's the line? This above all to thine own self be true. This is an interesting one because I suppose Data doesn't know who he is in this episode. He's uh, basically an amnesiac. Uh, on the other hand, he's very much Data. He's very decent. He's very kind. He kind of like tries to help everyone, even when they're treating him really badly. So I suppose you could say Data is, you know, Data is the guy who is always true to himself. Um, I wonder whether it also kind of refers to Troy, though, having to sort of learn something about herself. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I don't know whether it is really being true to Troy to do what she has to do in this, uh, you know, this is the episode where she has to kill Georgie on the holodeck, basically, in order to get promoted. Um, but I suppose it, I can't help feeling that the title sort of slightly resonates with that B story as well as with the A story there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, always doing that that right thing. I mean, that's comes, to, you know, to pass that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes <laughs> sacrificing your chief engineer, sending him down into a, a pit is sometimes the right thing to do for kind of the thing, you know, it's, you know, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So, you know, an, an interesting kind of pairing there. Now, next up is Shadow Play for DS9. Shadow Play, I think, is a reference to shadow puppetry. I think it's basically another uh, term for that. And I suppose that's what the holograms are. They're basically puppets. They're, they have the appearance of real people, but they're, they're not. Of course, a shadow puppet is almost the direct opposite of a hologram, insofar as a hologram is created out of light and a shadow puppet is created out of the absence of light. Um, but I think that's kind of the illusion going on there. Yeah, I would think so as well. You know, ultimately, they're you know light and shadows. That's what these these holograms ultimately are. They're they're little more than that. Next up, next gen episode masks again, a, like wildly mundane title for a completely off the wall episode. <laughs> uh, you know, almost tells us nothing about it in a way. It's one of these ones that like it seems to be sort of deliberately underselling how crazy the episode is. Yeah, exactly. I, it's it's one of those ones. It's you hear it, and you think, oh, that's pretty generic. When I feel like uh, this episode is underserved by a title like Masks, that there, there's got to be some more exciting Latin phrase or something from some sort of Egyptian mythology, something that could be a bit more dramatic than this. Well, the dramatis personae, actually, I should have said this when we were talking about it, in the ancient Greek theatre uh, were not the characters so much as they were the masks, I believe, uh, that depicted the different characters. So I suppose there is almost a link um, there insofar as you know in the next gen episode you do have this kind of idea of these identities of whatever they're called the sun and the moon uh i i have avoided that episode for many years <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember what they know masaka masaka and corgano something like that is that it anyway you know these kind of um there is there is something very much of the kind of dramatis personae there i suppose in the sort of theatrical masks um next up ds9 playing god this is the one with the micro universe and sort of what do they do with that but again, interesting, I suppose, that the title brings the kind of religious concept. I mean, obviously, playing God is like a phrase. It's a kind of expression. But um, it does sort of 
you, you, you know, it's 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 putting the G word in there, if you know what I mean. It's it's kind of bringing a, a religious perspective, at least potentially in terms of the title there. Yeah, and I think it's something that kind of sums up a lot of kind of Star Trek. You know, you think of something like Who Watches the Watcher, um, Blink of an Eye, you know, episodes where Star Trek kind of characters get mistaken for, for gods. And, you know, it's certainly understandable why it can happen sometimes. You know, these huge spaceships, you know, godlike imagery for, for other planets. You know, even something like Star Trek Into to Darkness, for example, right at the beginning. So, you know, it's something that we'll see kind of play out before and kind of you know what's past this prologue is is very true when it comes to star trek uh characters and situations meaning that they're taking on godlike uh um experiences next up eye of the beholder now obviously beauty is the eye of the beholder this is not so much an episode about beauty although there is uh the weird kind of um jealousy and kind of romance and, and stuff going on between Wolf and Troy in the episode. But I think it's this idea that of kind of things being subjective. Um, Troy in this episode has to literally see into the eye of the beholder, I suppose, as well, insofar as the whole thing hinges on her. This is the weird episode um, where it's all, a large part of the episode sort of takes place in Troy's head. But she sees an image of someone and she can't understand why the image is distorted and it turns out that she's seeing the reflection and she is seeing from the perspective of the person that she's seeing the image of if you see what I mean so she's not a third party beholder of that person she is actually the same person but she's seeing through the eye of the beholder i.e. the eye of the person who is seeing it if that makes sense so I, I suppose in that sense the the title is like actually quite specifically appropriate um more generally it's a slightly weird one because you do think of that as referring to beauty and it's not really an episode that's about beauty at all it's an episode that's about suicide and murder and all sorts of do you know what i mean like quite grisly uh nasty things it's an odd one in a way um next up profit and loss from ds9 now this again there's a slight uh a slight kind of double meaning there because i think the loss is not really about money. It's not, they're not profit and loss. They're not equal. The, the, it's more about lost love. It's about loss. The, 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 there's this sort of imbalance between those two halves. Do you know what I mean? It's not just the kind of, um, then they're, they're not exactly just two sides of the same coin that the loss is much weightier than the, than the profit could have been in a sense. But I suppose it's about the balance between those two things, the balance between, uh, you know, the kind of Ferengi way and the Ferengi, uh, desire for profit and the kind of romantic storyline um, that's going on there and the sense of um, of loss. Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a kind of interesting one, I suppose. It's classic with um, the, the Q version is the, the profit and loss. We have profit and lease. Um, I think there may be another one as well. So it's the, you know, the Ferengi version of a, a Q title. It is. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I guess you're right. Profits. Um, False prophets. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, you're right. There's a whole like sort of raft of, uh, profit related. Uh, and, and especially with DS9. I mean, there's this weird thing with, D you know, DS9 brought in both money and religion in Star Trek in a big way. And they both center on essentially the same word, profit. Uh, so you've got, which is why you can have, you know, false prophets, but it is, it's a very curious thing. And I don't know whether it's on any level conscious, but that they, in bringing religion into Star Trek, they brought them in as prophets and they then also brought in characters who were obsessed with making prophets. Um, so they've almost like tied the two concepts very tightly together, uh, in, in, in naming them in that way. It's an interesting, again, you know, talking about translation earlier, it's a curious quirk, like the guy whose arms dealer turned into a, you know, whatever it is, ended up losing his penis. It's like, as it happens in English, those two words uh, sound identical, even though they mean totally different things. And I feel there's kind of, it almost can't quite be a coincidence that that's, that that's what's going on. And it, it's something that's only they're conscious of because they're pointing it up in, you know, using uh, terminology like uh, false prophets or, you, you know, whatever. Yeah. Next up, I've got Genesis, the next gen episode, another one of those crazy Braga, uh, horror stories. Now, I guess they're de-evolving back to the point of their own Genesis. Is that the idea? I mean, Genesis is obviously the sort of starting point for all these things. I guess they're notionally heading in that direction. It's a slightly 
odd one in a way. Again, I feel it's one that slightly undersells. It sounds a bit scientific and a bit, almost a bit boring for what's quite a kind of squelchy, nasty, mad episode. Yeah, I suppose you always think of sort of the, um, the biblical version as well, sort of the, you know, the origin or formation of something. And these are sort of pretty much these primordial beings and spiders and, you know, are just you know, Klingon beasts and so on like that. It's, yeah, it's one of those ones. That, again, it sort of sums up very similar to Parallels. This is kind of what you're you're going to get with this episode unless you're sort of expecting a, a Phil Collins crossover. <laughs> well, that would have been an interesting one. Um, the next one I've got is Journey's End. Now, Journey's End is obviously a very famous play about World War One. I. I don't think that's what they were going for here. Um, also an episode of Doctor Who uh, in later years. I, I think it's a slightly odd choice of an episode. I mean, I guess what it's saying is that this is the end of Wesley's journey with the crew of the Enterprise and hence with the viewers who've been watching along for all these years. Although we've sort of done that already. It, it seems weirdly inappropriate for me because it's actually the beginning of the journey insofar as Wesley is literally going on a journey. He's going on a journey with someone whose name is the Traveller. Um, and this is the start of it, not the end of it. So it's a kind of, it's an odd one, I think. Yeah, I, I think so as well. It's, I suppose it kind of sums up Wesley's journey. I, I wish he didn't return. It would make kind of the title a bit more kind of sweeter. But yeah, it, it definitely feels like we're getting towards the, the end of, of kind of the, the series. And, you know, you always think of Journey's End. It's not just this episode title, but they end up doing that as a bit of a documentary just before all good things, you know, previewing the finale and then generations to, to come. So, you know, there's, there's a sort of double meaning there if you're into, Star Trek documentaries and special features. Now, the next one I have is an interesting one. This is the DS9 episode, The Wire. This obviously is a very popular uh, episode, great Garrick episode. I'm curious, what do you think The Wire refers to in this episode? I can't remember. Was Did we have this discussion recently? Or I had a discussion with someone where it was like, what does The Wire mean? And sort of, the, I wish I could remember who I was having this discussion with. Or I listened to a podcast where people were debating what The Wire meant. I'm now totally frazzled in my head. Um, and I can't even remember. Sort you may have been following my, my Twitter uh, discussion on this topic. <laughs> there we go. I'm just, I'm just curious. Because the reason I ask is... That, and I'm just scrolling through and failing to find it, which is poor preparation on my part. But basically it, it came up and I, I knew we were going to be doing this episode or I knew I was going to be doing this episode anyway. And I thought to myself, I actually have no idea what the wire is because the device that's in Garrick's head is never given a name as far as I know. Um, it, it's not cool. It would make, if, if, if they said, you know, oh, they put this thing, the Cardassian, you know, the Obsidian Order, they called it the wire, then it would sort of make perfect sense. Um so anyway, so I put this out on Twitter and various people uh, saying, you know, what, what does the wire refer to? Is this, uh, you know, are we down to the wire? Is this a wire? Is it about cutting a wire? You, you know, like diffusing a bomb sort of thing. And various people responded. Amy Nelson said, I always thought it was to do with a wire tap. Um, someone else said they, they assumed it was about the implant being a bit like wiring uh, and like barbed wire in his brain. Um I was sort of saying, does it have anything to do with the TV show The Wire, which I have to say I haven't seen, but I think that is about a wiretap, um, which I don't, I don't think is relevant here. Although again, you know, the Cardassians and wires, it would sort of feel thematically relevant. Uh, so then in the end, in, uh, desperation, I asked Robert Hewitt Wolf on Twitter <laughs> and he was kind enough to answer. Uh, so and since he wrote the episode, I think we can accept his answer. He said the wire is the device inside Garrick's head that he's addicted to. Which makes sense, even though it's weird that it's never named in the episode. Plus, he's a man on a wire. Now, I love that because I love that idea that, you know, so it, it sort of has a double meaning. It's, 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 it has a literal meaning, although it's a literal meaning, which is weirdly unliteral because it's not actually ever literalized, uh, on screen insofar as no one says that that's what this thing is called, but we're sort of supposed to assume that it refers to that. But then this idea that he's a man on a wire, uh, I like that. I like that idea that, you know, this is someone right on the edge, um, you know, in a very precarious situation. Yeah, I kind of assumed it would be sort of the, potentially the implant in, in his head. Um, but I'm so glad that we could get Robert Hewitt Wolf on to, uh, to to answer that question. We instead of looking up dictionaries, we should have just been live tweeting these these people. You know, they're they're having Star Trek Day. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, contribute. Well, you never know, though. I mean, when I interviewed Brandon Braga, he couldn't even remember writing the episode Cold Fire. So I think, you know, asking him why he called it that would have been a stretch. But yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Um, 
you, <laughs> you know, when they're available and willing to answer these questions, it certainly makes life easier. Um, the next one I had underlined is DS9 crossover. Um, just because obviously there's a sense of, you know, crossing over to the mirror universe. This is the rare mirror universe episode that doesn't pun on the idea of mirrors, you know, mirror, mirror through the looking glass, you, you know, all these kind of mirror related, uh, phrases. Um, but the idea of a crossover is an interesting one because normally we think of a crossover as being between two series. And it makes me think on some level, is this DS9 crossing over with the original series? Which I think it is insofar as, you know, they're going to talk about Captain Kirk. They're going to kind of explicitly uh, go into the sort of details of an episode of the original series in a way that Next Gen never did. Um, and that is quite bold and is, you know, as things go forward with DS9... Oh, I suppose by this point, we've already had Blood Oath, which kind of does that with those Klingon characters or bringing them back into the reality of the of the Star Trek universe. And obviously, we're going to get Trials and Tribulations, you know, coming up. But this is this is the episode. Is this almost a crossover episode uh, with TOS, but just, you know, in the DS9 time frame somehow? Yeah, I think that's what makes it quite a kind of charming episode is that sort of the, the element of kind of crossing over as you say it's kind of multiple ones that crossing over we see it sort of in further episodes to come where they sort of skip and hop into to these other kind of timelines and you know they cross over through a variety of different ways so yeah i, I definitely think and it's something that's embracing something from the original series that none of the other sort of shows have done really apart until sort of Star Trek Discovery with crossing over into this this alternative timeline and it's very interesting that this Deep Space Nine would choose to do that when they are often set on going their own way and the crossover episodes have you know a mixed reputation some are better than others but I think this one is certainly probably the the best one. The next one I have underlined for DS9 is another one of these slightly teasing titles the collaborator i think this is a bit of an underrated episode but it's interesting because it obviously raises the question who is the collaborator and that is going to be the question that's kind of going to occupy the whole episode so i sort of feel like this is one of those ones where the kind of very basic uh by the numbers title actually is interesting enough that it sort of teases something because it because it, there's an implicit question behind it somehow and it's such a you know an evocative one as well you're a collaborator collaborator i mean it's ne- whenever someone's called a collaborator it's certainly never a, a positive description as well so it's something that you know while a kind of slightly bland title on paper it's one of those ones that when sort of spoken aloud and thought about you think oh that's that's there's there's an edge to it there's a oh there, there's something about it i think think it's such a loaded word i suppose that's the thing especially in the context of you, you know the occupation and all this sort of thing it's a very loaded uh thing to call someone so you're right yeah it immediately kind of your ears are going to prick up um and then we get the next generation episode all good things uh all good things come to an end obviously quite a confident um statement i suppose obviously it's a it is a quote from the episode but also i feel like it is sort of a, a statement about next generation uh, being pretty awesome, frankly. And, you know, this is the last episode, but, you know, we know you're going to be heartbroken. There's no more next gen on TV, but, you know, it had to wrap up eventually. Uh, and it was pretty great, wasn't it? And, you know, here you go. You can go back to the, you know, we're going to go back to the first episode. We're going to kind of do, uh, or, not exactly do the highlights, but in a way, it's an episode that manages to do that and does it in quite a ballsy, bold way. Um, it's a great title for a finale for anything, but I just feel it's particularly appropriate for this show that really, uh, from a slightly rocky start, managed to just completely, you know, knock it out of the park, really, um, far surpassing anyone's expectations, become this huge cultural phenomenon, really. I think what makes it even kind of more better is obviously the, the full meaning is all good things must come to an end, but it's all good things. And then we've got the ellipses because it's not coming to an end. We've still got generations to come. I mean, like that was in the bag, like within minutes of probably finishing that. I mean, while this was going on, you have Braga and Moore writing the script for generations. You have the scenes already being filmed on the Enterprise B. You know, it's all good things. Yeah, they don't come to an end. It's still going to continue on. It kind of leaves you on, on that bit of suspense. So it's, it's nice that it can, it's not something as definitive as, um, what you leave behind. End game, you know, um, 
things like that. Um, so it's, it's interesting that these things will continue on. I mean, you, you think of like, these are the voyages, the, the enterprise one, you know, it, it also ends with ellipses because obviously it's a prequel. Things will continue on. Um, but I, I like that confidence of, um, all good things. No, it's not over. There, there's no end. So I, I always like that little bit of confidence that they were able to carry on with them. The trial never ends and no to Star Trek. Perfect quote on uh, Star Trek Day. Well, all good things do come to an end. And this seems like an appropriate moment to end this particular uh, chat about episode titles. Um, I'll be back again in due course, looking at the next little stretch when we'll be going into uh, not just Deep Space Nine, but Voyager as well. Um, So interesting kind of uh comparison to be had there in the meantime lee it's been fantastic having you on the show thank you very much for joining me um if our listeners want to get hold of you and uh tell you their own theories about you know what the wire might represent or or pick up any of these other uh topics we've been discussing ask you if you've got any more scottish proverbs up your sleeves um what's the best way for them to find you online yeah i'm happy to talk about how you can't break a stick in a bundle um with with anyone so yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good you one. <laughs> can find me on twitter at lee hutchson underscore um, and i host my own two podcast filibuster which is a general film and uh, culture one where we have touched upon star trek in the past and been lucky enough to have had people like ira stephen bear robert hugh wolf and and um, brandon braga on the show which has been been fantastic and um, the A24 project, which looks as the, the independent um, distributor A24, which has featured movies starring um, Patrick Stewart as a Nazi and Anton Yelchin in the same movie as well. So there's been some crossover. And we we recently kind of spoke about First Cow, which featured one of René Ebenezer's final ever appearances in, in film. So it was nice to pay tribute to, to him as well. So, yeah, you can find me on, on most places. Fantastic. Well, thanks as ever for joining me, Lee. Um, but talking about episode titles in The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine is not the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. So have a listen to what else you might have missed out on on the network. Previously on Trek.FM. The Line, a Star Trek Picard podcast. Like you're saying about JL, I remember at the time reading this, Rafi calling him JL. And I remember that feeling weird to me. Like you, the first time it was in the comic. And then I was like, JL, that's kind of casual. But like you said, she kind of talks to that. And But now rereading it, when I got to that, it just makes so much sense because I'm used to it now. It just seems so natural. But at the time, it felt a little odd. Earl Grey. This is that McCoy is still alive. Mm-hmm. And he goes and picks up McCoy. And Scotty and McCoy have adventures throughout the galaxy in their own run no, then they go and find the Nexus and get <laughs> and get Kirk back and it's the three of them that go uh, and they go to Romulus of course as well to help out Spock with the yeah. and then they go to the Genesis planet because obviously there's remnants of it after it blew up and they find some Spock DNA and they use some Borg maturation chamber to make themselves a mini Spock but it goes wrong, so Spock is only like six inches tall. <laughs> pocket yes. Spock. And, and McCoy can put him in his pocket all the time. I'd like a base. We we'll call him. McCoy love he's that. Got a, he's yeah. got a wee kind of lapel pocket. Yeah, I like this, a breast pocket. We'll call him Spocket. Spocket. Spocket <laughs> in McCoy's pocket. Uh, I like that. Okay. Primitive culture. A look at history and culture through Star Trek. That whole title sort of feels like the the beginnings of what Roddenberry would do with with Q, and having all those play on Q basically. Oh, yeah. Which I think I think had exactly. you had Mud come back, you know, more. It's almost a shame that Discovery hasn't picked up that. And and when they had Here Harry Mud, in, yeah, <laughs> exactly. They should have done that. They resisted the temptation for the cheap. I mean, that is, as I say, there is always a temptation with these things to go for the cheap pun. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's the right decision to, to resist. I don't know. Uh, um, I think a cheap pun is the right call every time, Duncan, to be honest. The ready room. What does it mean to be artificial? And when you cross that barrier from being biological mm-hmm. to being artificial... But your your memories have been transferred. How much of who you are 
is the memory that you acquire over the course of your life? And how much of it is the biological system of your body? And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners' group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture, and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trek.fm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trek.fm, to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons' website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month, so we really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all our details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our associate producers on Primitive Culture, Amy Nelson, Clara Cook, and Tony Black. Amy is a presenter of many other shows on the network, and you can find her on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. Clara and Tony were two of the former co-hosts of this show, and they'll be popping back from time to time. You can find Clara on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC, and Tony at at AJ Black Writer. You're blended already.